Yes, a very good afternoon, Wild Earthians. Thank you so much for joining us here on our sunset safari in the Sabi Sands, South Africa. Good afternoon. My name is Cedric Dold, and behind the camera here on Rusty this afternoon, we've got Johan. So thank you so much for joining us on such a warm day. I tell you, it is really hot today. I think it's about 31, 32 degrees Celsius at the moment. Not much of uh, a breeze coming through and the sun is really sharp uh, this afternoon but i am looking forward to a splendid uh, safari and uh, i'm hoping that we're going to find some amazing things for everybody well on wendy this afternoon we have got uh, tessa and a panda at the waterholes we got uh, lisa and down there in the eastern cape at amakala we've got ralph and morgan and karicha we've got jade and up there in the mara We've got uh, David. So please, if you've got any comments or questions, suggestions, some stories that you do want to send through to us, please go onto our uh, website. It is wildearth.tv. Go onto our questions page and make sure that you do register with us so you can send those questions and comments through. It is uh, free, it is easy to re do the registrations. And uh, if not, you want to go onto the scan or the, the QR code in, there is a little white box at the bottom of the screen. Just open your camera on the cell phone, frame up that QR code in, and it'll take you directly to our questions page. So yes, 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 yes. Please send those comments, questions, and everything through to us. We are waiting in anticipation for all those things. Looking forward to this afternoon. First of all, I am going to head towards the Mulawati. Yeah, I'm going to go. I know Tess said she had some uh, female leopard tracks, fresh ones this morning around Spaghetti Crossing. Heading north up the Mulawati. I remember I found Tlalamba the other day uh, heading up that Molawati in one of the Tamboti trees. So I'm going to head into that little two track, see if I can pick up on any fresh tracks of uh, Tlalamba and try and follow up on her this afternoon. And of course, uh, Tess and uh, Panda, uh, they are working on the western side of uh, Juma Private Game Reserve. They are going to be trying, they're going to be following up on the buffaloes and of course those in Kuhuma female lines and uh, seven cubs so I'm hoping that they can find them that side as well but yes please yes. if you've got any suggestions if you've got any characters that you love to see this afternoon let us know if you want us to go early on to the hyena den or later on let us know if there's any specific hyena that you want to try and see let us know and I'm sure a lot of people are very anxious to see Tlalamba again. So that is definitely one of the big ones I want to go to. But yeah, well, we are going to make our way to hopefully Akula Molawati. Uh, let's see what the weather is like around today. Good afternoon, everybody. Oh, wow, a hot day. It is 29 degrees Celsius here in Juma. And of course, you can see the heat is really affecting the animals already this afternoon. We've started off with our herd of buffaloes that Cedric had this morning close to the lines. And you can see everybody is sticking to the shade. My name is Tess. I'm going to be your natural on safari here for the afternoon. Behind the camera is Panda. There's the thumb. We're on Wendy and hopefully this afternoon our plans will include sticking around with the herd of buffalo for a little bit and then we're going to go and see if we can find those lions that Cedric had this morning. So we've done a bit of a switcheroo this afternoon to see if we can find uh, to see if we can find um, some different things to this morning for Cedric and I. But for now the herd of buffalo seems to be quite relaxed in the shade. They've formed a bit of a roadblock, so I don't know how we're going to get around them to look for the lines. And I've been informed that apparently my mouth is not doing what my words are doing, so I apologize. For now, I will not be looking at the camera. <laughs> now, literally all the way around the left-hand side of Wendy, down right the way through to the right, there are buffaloes everywhere. This is quite a large herd. 
probably the same herd we had at Gowrie Dam yesterday. And you can see they're literally hugging the patches of shade. So there's very few buffaloes standing around in the sun. Most of them are trying to find a small patch of shade. This is a bit challenging though because things are starting to dry out. So that means that there's not much shade left. So this is a pretty smart decision to come to the seep line because even if the trees don't have leaves, there's lots of trees close together. So the trunks cause a bit of shade. But luckily for myself and Panda, we found a very tiny patch of shade as well. Thomas, I agree, it is quite a relaxing start to the afternoon. I'm quite excited to see what's going to happen today because the fact that these buffaloes haven't moved means that they have been relaxed as well the whole day. So I don't know whether the lines have moved either. Now we have of course been looking for some yellow-billed ox pickers, no luck just yet. We did find some red-billed ones and unfortunately what they seem to be doing is drinking blood straight from the open wound of this female. So if you are a sensitive viewer, maybe don't look just yet. But she has got a wound on her side, you can see she's lying in the middle of the road. She's got a bit of white patch on her skin, so she's lost a bit of hair. She's got some old wounds, but she's also got some slightly fresher ones. And these ox peckers are getting blood straight from the source. Instead of looking for ticks, why not just get your food straight from the source? So these are red-billed ox peckers. They are quite well known for doing this. And it might be a little bit uncomfortable for her, but she's not too worried about it. If she was, she would have been chasing them off. But you can see she's not even flicking her tail. She's just sitting and allowing the ox pickers to feed. She's even got one on her face. It's currently sitting on her boss, but it's been digging in her eye as well, just in the corner of the eye where you might find some ticks. Ah, and down it bounces towards the back to join the others. Now, I'm not sure what caused those wounds. It could have been a fight with another buffalo. Those horns are very sharp. It could have been lions but it doesn't look like an extremely fresh wound. It looks like it's been there for a while and it just kind of keeps opening, as they do. We know this, when we have scabs, they sometimes reopen. And it's exactly the same in animals. They have less medical care than we do, but their immune systems are probably a lot stronger. So for her, this probably isn't as much of an issue as it would have been for a human to have a gash. She is quite an old cow, she's lost a bit of hair, so you can see down her chest in particular. There are clear straps where she's losing hair. And this is just from years and years of rubbing past bushes and trees as she's walking, maybe even intentionally scratching herself. <laughs> Daniel, the wound does look quite deep. You can see a lot of it has healed already. So it looks like it was a gash all the way from potentially her right hip all the way over her back and down the left hand side. So it almost looks to me as though maybe a lion pounced on her back and slid off the side and the claws made a bit of a hole. It's a little bit weirdly shaped I suppose for a horn unless she was lying down when it happened. But most of it has healed already and I would imagine that would have taken a good month or two to heal like that. Those open sections that we can see are relatively small compared to the rest of the scarring. So there's one at the bottom where the one ox picker is feeding. And that's a kind of longish gash. And then one up at the top. And um, a gash like that I would imagine would probably take, you know, even just the top part that's open would take a good week or two to close nicely. But then heal properly, maybe a month or two. Because remember, being out here, the ox peckers are going to keep opening it. Anything that she rubs against or if she has to move quickly and bumps into another buffalo, that might tug the skin and that might loosen where it has started healing. So it, I suppose it depends, you know. Buffalo to buffalo, how active they are, what happens to each individual buffalo. Ideally, I suppose you'd want it to heal in a day or two, but it just wouldn't be possible. This is a really nicely mixed herd. There seem to be a lot of males, a lot of differently aged females, quite a few calves. But everybody's pretty relaxed except that one standing in the road that's giving us the stink eye currently. <laughs> 
a really nice wide set of horns and it looks like it's a youngish male so he's still coming into his prime with that closed boss on the top. Yeah, just moving slowly down the Mulawati. I'm just keeping my eyes open. I'm doing it at a very slow pace, a snail pace at the moment. Um, just to see if I can get any sign of uh, that female leopardess. Oh, that leopardess. Oh, the lumber. Look around. And as I said, it's quite warm today, so maybe in the tree, maybe lying in the tree, enjoying the breeze on top somewhere. So I'm hoping if she does come here, I'll go into one of the trees here and do rest all on the sun, cool sand somewhere in the shade. Definitely not in the sun. I don't think she would be liking that at the moment. Niola, I just ran there. Oh, that's a good thing, just to keep those eyes peeled in the shade, in the grass, in the trees. Try and think like a leopard. I'm getting hot. Where do I want to go and lie down now? What do I want to do? That's, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, we are going to do a little bit of a bumpy. Um, I'll do a little bit slow down here. Yeah. Oh, Easy does it. So it's interesting, the longer we've been sitting here, the more the buffalo have been approaching us. A lot more of them are standing up and now starting to take a few steps forward and look at us as though they're saying, what do you know that we don't know? Why are you sitting here? <laughs> and they're not bothered by us. They're not trying to chase us off. They're not trying to intimidate us necessarily. I think they're just curious. I suppose like we would be if we were sitting and noticed somebody was sitting watching us, you might draw your attention to that and wonder what's going on. It's exactly the same here. Interesting though, it seems to be mostly females. So that one standing on the left of the road is a female and she's been giving us the stinker and coming closer. She came from the far left and approached us. And she's, she's looking pretty grumpy, but that's the typical buffalo look. They don't have a very friendly looking face. We absolutely love them to bits and pieces, but they don't have a particularly friendly looking face. When they look at you, they look at you as though they're always giving you the stink eye. So it's a very, it's an oddly charismatic animal, put it that way. It's charismatic in a weird, different way. And I really enjoy it. And then we've got the youngish male standing here on the right, behind the female with the wound. And he's also edged a bit closer now into the shade. And he's just staring at us. A massive wide set of horns but if you compare that to the older slightly more experienced buffaloes the two lying in the grass down to his right or his left our right those two experienced buffaloes that is a big bull with a massive boss he's old you can see he's got a few little fat rolls on his face some fat deposits he's lost some hair he's got so much character on those horns and then a very old female literally lying right in front of him as well. They're not too bothered. Even the old female on the road hadn't been too bothered. But the slightly younger ones, 
are kind of looking at us going, what are you doing? Ah, there you go, she lost interest. So you can kind of tell the age of the buffaloes by looking at how brown the coats are as well. You don't just have to look at characters like scars or hair loss or particularly fat deposits in males under the boss. They've got a much thicker forehead, if that makes sense. You can also look at the coat color. <clears throat> the older they get, the more kind of charcoal-y colored they get with these patches of smokiness in between where they started losing hair and getting some scars on the skin. Where the slightly younger ones have the more brownish tinge and the females are browner than males as well. So if there were two females standing next to each other, you could probably compare their age quite easily by comparing color. There's a nice half standing in the gap there, Panda, that's nice and it's almost a tawny color, like a pretty brown. Have a look at that. So all the buffaloes are born this very light chocolatey colour, milk chocolate I suppose, and fluffy, that one lost fluff, but compare that to the buffalo that's just walked into the picture on the right, and look at how charcoal-y that one looks. Still a bit chocolate on the side, but much more charcoal. Oh, and this one's scratching herself, Panda, look at that one to the right of... <laughs> She's found a branch and she is scratching an itch somewhere. Oh, and she's definitely found the right spot. You can see it looks like she's having a really good time. So this is not at all for the purpose of scent marking like you would see in other animals like leopards rubbing their cheeks or chin against something. She's purely scratching an itch. Zebras really enjoy doing that as well. The males can scratch their horns on trees as a form of scent marking, but that is definitely not what she's doing. <laughs> Itchy are places that are hard to reach on your own. Matthew, female buffaloes definitely have a slightly differently shaped horn to a male, but also between females, they have differently shaped horns. So no two buffaloes will ever have identical horns. They have very different horn shapes. And females versus males is very different as well. It's what we call the boss. So if you have a look at that one, Ah, oh, that's perfect, Panda. So this big one down in the grass, you can see his boss really clearly. I'm hoping it is in the shade, so it's a little bit difficult. But he's got that very lumpy section right on the top of his head called the boss. And this is particularly prominent in males because it's designed to protect the head and the brain and the skull when they're having big impacts when they're fighting. So male buffaloes also have a much wider neck. In general, though, their horns are a lot thicker towards the tip. They're a lot more rounded and a lot bigger and heavier. If we have a look at a female, so Panda, you can go to the one standing in the road. The two that are currently standing, the one on the right, that's the big male that was standing a little bit closer. His boss isn't as developed, but it is all the way up to the middle of his head versus the one that's just walked in on the left. There, you can see that patch of hair on the top of her head. Her horn doesn't actually <laughs> extend. Never mind, you could see it, now you can't. Oh, a bit of a scuffle. So the horns don't go all the way to the middle of the head like a middle path. The middle of the head on a female is hair. It's not protected by horn. The horns only start just above the ears on the side of the head. And that's because the females don't really clash in those big impacts like the males do. So you can definitely tell the difference between male and female buffaloes by looking at the horns and the boss in particular, that section in the middle that would make the middle path and the like, helmet, I suppose you could call it, on the top of the head. But it can be tricky if you're looking at a young male buffalo who doesn't have a particularly well-pronounced boss. It can be confusing and like this one could look like a female if you look very quickly because his boss isn't well-formed. But usually females will have hair on that middle part that makes that lumpy. It almost looks like a moustache, that middle section of the moustache, I suppose. Do you think you could get... Uh, it might be behind the termite mound here, Panda, that male there that's looking at us now and walking towards us. So he is hiding behind a termite mound and a tree, but he's got a very well-pronounced boss. 
you can clearly see the moustache shape of his horns and that middle section with the thick middle path and the lumpy bits on the top of each side of that middle path. That's the boss. And that is very typically a male buffalo. He's got all of that character on his horns from years of fighting and impact, from rubbing his horns against trees and things. He gets color on there. He gets a bit of scarring, I suppose you could call it, on there. And he's got a very well pronounced boss. You can also see the fat rolls I was talking about just below. Oh, wow, all the ox pickers flying off. I think it might be because there's a vehicle on Triple M. But usually when ox pickers start flying like that, they might be trying to warn the buffaloes that there's something coming like the lions. But I think it was the truck that gave them a fright. So if you look underneath his boss, there's two very prominent looking wrinkles above his eyes. Those are those fat deposits I was talking about. And that is a really useful tool to age a male buffalo. A very old male buffalo has more and more fat deposited on the head because of course he's had a lot more time, but also because as he gets older, he's preparing more and more for more impacts. So those fat rolls a young bull would not have, those wrinkles above the eyes. So you see even animals get wrinkles as they get older. <laughs> I think the only one that goes in reverse is maybe an elephant is born with more wrinkles because it still has to grow into them. <laughs> I'd love to get a male and female right next to each other to show you the difference. We'll see if we can find them. Oh, that is such an old bull with so much character running off there. I'm trying to see a really good point of comparison. I don't see any that are overly clear other than the two maybe lying in the road panda in the middle of that big bull that was looking at us, the young one. There's two buffaloes lying, one closer to us, one behind. One closer to us is a female, one behind is a male. And you can just see the difference in their horns there. The one at the back, look at that big lumpy boss, that's the male, and the one closer to us, that's the female. Since the dawn of time, man has worshipped the cat. And now, in 2022, we are no better. But here at Wild Earth, you could say our cats are a little... bigger. As part of our Leopard Fest, we want to hear from you. Email us your favourite leopard sightings that you saw whilst watching Wild Earth over the last few years and include the date and a link where possible. Join us in paying tribute to our royal family.
we've changed our view a little bit. We've moved around the side of the big chunk of buffaloes that was lying in the road. And it seems like the oxpeckers are still having a bit of a party. They're flying in big circles in the air. There's probably about a hundred of their panda, easily. And they're all calling and flying in circles. But none of the buffalo are alerted by it. So I have a feeling it's just the ox pickers having a bit of a fly after that truck came past. And they're going to go back to relaxing just now. The buffalo are definitely not worried about it. The ox pickers, I don't know if you can see them there in the sky, just kind of cloud of ox pickers and a fly in front of the camera. <laughs> that was funny. But the buffalo are still just enjoying the shade. A few of them have come closer to us again. And now we've got a nice clear view of quite a few of them in this gap. So it'll be interesting to see how long these buffalo sit still for and whether or not those lions come any closer. But I think I'm going to go look for the lions and see if they have moved. And I'll send you over to Lisa to say good afternoon from the waterholes. Thank you so much, Tace, and a very warm welcome afternoon to everyone. My name is Lisa. I'm one of the new naturalists, and I am so, so, so amped to be with all of you. Honestly, um, it's so exciting to me. And I know I'm not, it doesn't seem like I'm looking at much right now at Mashatu. There is actually a crocodile here in the water, and of course, as Murphy's Law would have it, just as soon as we head on over to him, he stopped putting up a show. But he was literally just, I think he's playing with a carcass or something there in the water. He was splashing around profusely now. And um, of course, when I wanted to show all of you, he pretends like nothing is going on. So just bear with me. I just want to see, hopefully he does something again. But you can see he's actually underwater, busy feeding on that carcass. Again, I'm not too sure what it was or is, um, but he's having a magnificent time there with his happy meal. But literally just before I wanted to show all of you, he was splashing around and I don't know, he was doing some sort of gymnastics, aqua gymnastics in the water. But as you can see right now, he's just underwater feeding on whatever that may be. Robert, that is a wonderful question. Animals are active literally, <laughs> from what I've seen, literally whenever they want. Um, again, we say this a lot as guides or as naturalists. Um, the animals don't read books, but they literally don't. Um, we, of course, study their patterns and sort of watch what they're doing in general. But of course, when it's hot, animals do tend to be in the shade a bit more. Uh, just to sort of conserve their energy. But honestly, it differs. Like literally every drive I've done in my entire life has differed. Sometimes you think, oh, it's perfect weather. We're going to see so many animals. And then you take like three hours just to see a Mie Impala, which are those beautiful animals walking up to the watering hole as right as well right now. Um, but it really differs, honestly. Um, I've had drives where it's poured with rain 
And I thought, uh, we're not going to see too much today. And then you see so much. Ooh, there we go. You see, there's our crocodile. And of course, you can see the impalas are very vigilant. They know there's um, something with massive jaws in the water. However, it do it does seem like they sort of know, okay, well, he's got something else there keeping him busy, so <laughs> let's quickly take a chance. Jeffrey, definitely, the impalas are most certainly putting themselves in danger. Of course, they have to be very vigilant and very careful right now. However, animals are very, very clever. Somehow these impalas seem to know, okay, well, there's something there. It is dangerous, but it does seem busy with something else. Um, but of course, you know, this crocodile could, if the opportunity presents itself for long enough, he could go for an impala as well. However, he seems fairly busy there underwater. But again, with nature, you never know. We might think one thing and then Mother Nature says surprise. But as you can all see, they are, of course, very, very vigilant. However, they pu are putting those massive rocks between them and the croc. Ooh, this ram seems a bit, I don't know if he's brave or not so clever. I don't know if I would do that. <laughs> but maybe he's trying to put on a show for the others, other impalas. I stand corrected that Ram was being a beautiful leader and husband or boyfriend. <laughs> I don't know what their relationship status is yet, but uh, he was in fact leading the ladies to safety. Just telling them, okay, well, it's nice over here. We've got rocks and everything, but how about we play it super safe and move away from Mr. Crocodile, who seems to be busy again. Let's just have a look. I realize this is not the relevant theme song, 
But honestly, when I see all of that with that Impala over there, <laughs> I just hear... Tarim, 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 tarim. Nope. Crocodile's too busy. Impala's not interested. Man, I was hoping for some action. Mashatu, lovely, lovely, lovely. That is fantastic. Well done, Nisa. That is uh, a great sighting. Definitely a great sighting. I don't think I, I haven't seen a, I haven't seen a crocodile feed for years. I don't know when last I've seen a crocodile feed on something. Oh, yeah, we actually saw that. No, I didn't. No, we didn't. Sorry, I thought I did. I didn't. I don't know why I said I did. I think maybe it was on uh, the Mara feed I was thinking about. All right, I've done Vulture's Nest. Nothing coming on Vulture's Nest. I am going to go on Neola South. Just double check on uh, Neola South. Yeah. Oh, there's a nice giraffe tracks, yeah? Giraffe tracks heading up into that direction. I want to see if we can get some last ones aside. I'll show you. Stop there. I think those giraffe has moved a little bit further through, through the bush here. Oh, yeah. Alright, I'm going to try and get out here and take a look here quickly. Make sure nothing is around me. Alright. All right, we've got two different tracks here. This is, gonna, this is quite nice. All right, I'm just quickly sussing this out here. Yeah. Oh, So I'm just taking a look here quickly. I'm just uh, sussing out this uh, this area. Um, first of all, we've got a nice big hooved animal that is coming into this uh, direction. Nice and fresh. So how this hooved animal looks like. It's first of all, it's an angular grade. And second of all, it's got a center part, a center line, like an island in the middle. So what happens, you've got the one nail here. Goes there, it goes all the way around and comes there and then of course then they've got the center so that's a one nail and then you've got the second nail that's coming all the way around there coming up and also coming around so you can see he's got the two nails so this is known as an even toed ungulate and uh, quite a wide uh, and quite a long uh, hoof as well and definitely it is definitely not like an impala or a kudu. You can imagine an impala or kudu with such a uh, such a big hoof. Uh, this is a giraffe, of course, and this giraffe is heading into uh, that uh, direction. So that's an even-toed ungulate. All your even-toed ungulates is things impala, buffalo, um, kudu, niada, all those things are even-toed ungulates. But then, of course, you've got things like your zebra, uh, rhinos, those are odd-toed ungulates. So the zebra's got like a typical uh, hoof. And then, of course, uh, uh, the one hoof, uh, or the one nail on the hoof, and uh, of course the rhino's got three. 
and that's like oh, sorry, an odd number, odd toed ungulate. All right, and then I'm going to show you here. I know everyone can take a look here. It looks like definitely a oh, hyena has been running here. So this is another nice track. All right, so not the prettiest track. It's only got the really the two lobes at the back here, the one, two at the back, and not a real pretty track. So hyenas are really much walking on their feet, like in a funny, a funny angle, and uh, it looks like it has been running. So I'm just going to get up here quickly and show you if you can take a look here. So you can see where this hyena has been running. You can see how deep those tracks have gone in. You can see it's a lot of pressure that's been uh, put down, and it looks like the hyena has been running up the road towards up the Niola South, heading uh, north maybe to one of the pans or maybe towards Biffelzook Dam, um, no idea, but hyenas can cover great distances just by, of course, the typical that bounds, how they hop like that and when they run and they don't have to spend so much energy. All right, well, let's carry on. Just trying to look for any other tracks for maybe Columba. That's my main aim. The last tracks came into Spaghetti Crossing this morning. Nothing went up the uh, Molawati, so I am going to go up a little bit here. Just take a look in this drainage line. I want to see where this hyena is going. That's just another thing. Maybe this hyena will take us to where the lumber is. You never know. Let's go. Take a look. As well, quickly an update as well. Still no, still no tracks on the, the youngsters. Um, yeah, just uh, just for Tulamba. So yesterday I had a tracks, this morning um, Tess had a tracks, and uh, unfortunately just for her at this point in time. Okay, well we're going to continue up uh, this side. Let's head over to Tess to see how her afternoon safari is going. Cedric, I really, really, really hope you get lucky with her this afternoon. We have just gotten lucky with the Nkuhuma lionesses and seven cubs. They've actually moved from where Cedric had them earlier, and that's why the buffalo are so relaxed. They've moved further east. In fact, we're almost at the junction with Zoe's and Philemon's now. So um, we had a little bit of a panic. We got to the two track, tried to find the lions, couldn't find them. So we had to use our gut feel and look for the most shade and we found them probably another hundred meters further east so that's why the buffalo have relaxed we cannot see the buffalo at all from where we are and i know cedric could definitely see the buffaloes earlier and they've settled pretty much where where he left them but you can see we had a little bit of activity the lioness was moving and one of the other ones briefly got up as well but all that happened was we did a slight reposition and now we're in a new patch of shade <laughs> So as the sun is moving, the shade is changing where it's lying on the ground or where it's hitting the ground. And so as they're getting hot, they're moving one by one closer to the bigger patch of shade. Although I don't know what they're going to do when they get to those logs, Panda, unless they drape themselves over the logs because <laughs> there's a, a fallen tree or something here down in the grass. And that's the main patch of shade is now these big branches and there's some smaller ones in there too that won't be very comfortable to lie on. So they might have to move and potentially I suppose in the direction of, of Treehouse Dam or the pan systems on Shibamo Track. But we are experiencing a few cute little cuddle moments. The cubs, particularly on the right hand side there, are cuddling up to one of the lionesses. And then there's just two off on their own listening to the buffaloes. But look at those faces. Do they not look like the most content lion cubs you've ever seen? Look at that. Tails, paws, noses, everywhere. Oh, that lioness can hear the buffalo. So this is a pretty prime example of why you should never think that there's no predators around just because animals are relaxed. These lions have been here the whole day. 
Oh, that was a big roll. Ethan, they have been moving um, since probably early hours of last night, so I'm sure they are quite tired. Also remember, it's normal for lions to be sleeping during the day, and it is exceptionally hot today. So any patch of shade will be great for them to be lying around for the rest of the afternoon. In fact, they moved from quite far south, close to the Mulawati drainage line, and then came across into Juma. So there's no males here. They've probably left the males somewhere else. And if I'm not mistaken, there's one of the Avoka males on Little Gauri. And the other one is somewhere close to the Mulawati, also further south. So they've kind of split up a little bit, but you can bet anything that if these lionesses manage to kill a buffalo, which is very ambitious for three lionesses because the cubs aren't really old enough to help, those males will definitely come and find these lionesses and that food. But let's see, maybe we'll get some movement just now. They might move to a different patch of shade. For now, let's head over to Rolf at Amakala to see if he has managed to find any cats. Fantastic, the Inkahumas have been found. Well, we have found Pumalela with her two youngsters. Sorry about the radio. And uh, we're coming to you live from the Amakala Private Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape Province of South Africa. And lovely that we've been able to find the cheetah so early on in the drive. My name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera I've got Morgan with me. Welcome aboard folks. The largest game drive in the world and fantastic that we've been able to find her um, and I'm hoping that with her looking out over the plains like that she's thinking of her stomach. Now don't forget that it is an interactive immersive experience please send through your questions and your comments using the link wild earth.tv forward slash questions or scan the QR code on the right of your screen when it appears and as I say get involved with the largest game drive in the world wonderful sight to see cheetah on a game drive especially here in the Eastern Cape the wind is getting up it's quite strong at the moment and that's why they're sort of sitting on the leeward side of that thicket just out of the wind but still in the sun and they might now get harassed by this raven just shouted at them in disgust and off he went she's looking out over the plain there are some blessed book down there lying down ruminating I didn't see any springbok but uh, who knows there might be some blessed book on the menu Pumalela meaning success in Isikosa and well, up until now, it's been a success with these two youngsters, but they are still learning how to hunt. They've caught and killed their own little baby springbok, but a blessed bok is a whole different kettle of fish. She's only about three and a half years old, so she's still quite young herself, but she's an accomplished hunter already but she can only get better and with her now she's got to teach these two how to do exactly that they have been quite lazy waiting for her as they do as the youngsters do but slowly but surely I think they'll start to assist her in the hunting So Jesse, these cubs or sub-adults, they're around 10 months old now and any time from now, sort of about a year and a half, um, they'll start hunting on their own but they'll maintain this little coalition of three of them um, and they'll start hunting together. So 
it's quite exciting the times ahead because we're going to slowly start having three of them hunting and then then it will be that they could even take down bigger prey than they would normally especially if they were on their own so I've seen in different places like on the Valgefonden game reserve there was a female with three cubs and they all started assisting her and they were actually taking down blue wildebeest um, it was very interesting to watch them and they would really work together so it's exciting because we could see some very interesting chases hunts and kills coming from these three the initial period is a little bit disconcerting because they can try to take on things bigger than they should the one youngster here we've already witnessed him try to take on a red heart to beast which was well out of his reach um, and the heart to beast also being very big very strong and very fast uh, but he'll learn he or she it seems like it is a male and a female with these two youngsters but slowly but surely they'll start to learn and each individual is different but there's sort of that general between a year year and a half they'll um they'll participate in the hunting and eventually it's normally the adult that leaves the younger ones once they are hunting for themselves it 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 comes to the point where the youngsters are actually they make a kill and the youngsters are eating everything and so then the, the female sort of gets to the point where she's she's hungry she's doing a lot of hunting but not a hell of a lot of eating so and then she pretty much moves off on her own and normally leaves them there in a in a spot where she would have chosen for them so i've witnessed that kind of uh progression with a number of of different females in the cubs on different game reserves and each place and individual cheetah have sort of done the timing differently uh, in accordance with the availability of food as well as the the sort of performance of the youngsters so for now they are a little bit flat but they're looking interested and I'm interested in just hanging with them. The cheetah stakeout, one of my favorite things to do out on safari. And uh, with us having the opportunity, I'm not going anywhere. We're going to stay right here and see what happens. But we are going to send you back up to Tessa with the Nkumas. Join me, David along with our expeditioners as we take a look at the highlights of this week in the Maasai Mara. What have you enjoyed most about your trip? The leopard that we saw in the Mara was just phenomenal. She was so beautiful. It's going to be hard to leave. This highlight fires a chart is open to all registered viewers. Register for free on our website.
waiting patiently to see what this young male is going to do. He's been grooming for quite a while. And I think he might get up and come over to these lines on the left. They seem to have found the thicker patch of shade, a more consistent patch. Maybe he'll get up to join his brother. It's a very peaceful scene. Quite different to the buffalo. As much as the buffalo were lying around, they were still kind of paying attention to us, I suppose. Craig, it is possible for lions to have twins. I suppose it's a bit confusing and the only way that you would really know is if you did a full DNA test. But because lions have multiple cubs per litter, you can't consider them twins, you would consider them brother and sister or sisters, but it is possible for a single embryo to split and cause identical twins, for example. But it would literally require a DNA test for us to tell the difference because lions look so similar, especially when they're small, that um, you wouldn't actually know whether they were actual twins or just litter mates, brothers and sisters. So it is always possible for any animal to have twins because mutations happen, accidents happen, and um, ultimately when especially identical twins are, are formed, it's because the fertilized egg splits in half when it probably shouldn't have. So the normal cases where it doesn't, this happens even in humans, that's why we can have twins, elephants can have twins, buffaloes can have twins. If that fertilized egg splits in two in the early stages of development, two separate embryos will carry on developing and that is the identical twins that we talk about. They've got the same DNA from the same fertilized egg that split accidentally in the reproductive process. So while the embryo was growing, it split in the very early stages and then two formed and those will be identical. But I suppose it would be very, very tough to tell. It probably does happen here or there, but you'll probably find it's less likely to happen in animals like lions or wild dogs or things like that, for example, because they have so many cubs or pups at the same time, many eggs are released, and so it's probably less likely for something like that to happen where an egg splits. You'll find it probably happens more commonly in animals that release one egg at a time, and then that egg sometimes splits and that can cause twins. That's very different to non-identical twins. Non-identical twins is when two eggs are released instead of one. So it's two separate sets of DNA, two separate eggs that are fertilized and so non-identical twins don't even have to look similar at all. But I would love to know if anyone's ever studied that in depth and taken DNA samples from multiple litters of cubs in different prides and compared the DNA to see if any of them are twins. Ultimately though, I suppose, it doesn't really matter to the lions, does it? As long as there's numbers, lions are the only social predator of the big predators we have here. So that social structure is really the reason why, they, um, why they're successful. But I actually, I studied genetics at university, so that, that kind of stuff really interests me. And how different animals inherit different genes. Are you trying to suckle at this age? Goodness gracious me, you're about to get swatted. <laughs> Kicked off unacceptable, how dare you. Far too old to be suckling from mum or auntie. <laughs> Taking a chance. I don't know what this lioness has seen or heard. I'm looking behind us. Pandas also just looked behind us at the same time. It's as though she's staring right through the back of Wendy. Gathering information. But I would love to study the genetics of the different prides and the cubs within the pride, the different lionesses. You know, we've done the DNA project with leopards using leopard scat, and you can do the same thing with lions. But it would be incredibly difficult, I suppose, to tell, to tell which lion is which. You know, you've physically got to see the scat, the poo actually drop out of the animal's bum 
to be able to collect it. That's how the DNA process works because you have to be 100% certain. You actually have to see it drop. You have to see it being excreted. And so if you've got a whole pride of lions and they're all going to the bathroom at the same time, how are you going to remember unless it happens one here, maybe one there, and you've got a video and you can go back and compare. That would be a good way. Go back and compare. Okay, it was that cub with that scar on that hip. That's that cub. It would be a little bit more complicated to get that study done. But did you know you can also tell a lot of interesting genetic things from an animal's hair? You can take clippings of an animal's hair and do DNA studies on that as well. I almost did a master's thesis on that. Using hair samples to tell the diet of animals and how it varies. And that's right the way down to you can tell what proportion are insects, what proportion are other rodents, things like that. When you're looking at different animals and you take a clipping of their hair, you can tell what proportion of their diet was made up by different proportions or families of other animals. It's very interesting. Clearly not as interesting as whatever the lioness was looking at. It's, uh, that's disappeared. I said that the wrong way around, didn't I, Panda? We are talking about something more interesting than what she was looking at. There we go. She's lost interest. She's gone back to sleep. <laughs> Oh, goodness gracious, we have some lazy, tawny lions. So she's now facing, that lioness on the left is facing towards the area of Philemon's treehouse dam. And there is a prominent game path that's going that way. She's actually lying on it. So if she carries on going that way, she'll end up on Philemon's cut line, potentially going to that little pan system on Shibamo track. But I somehow doubt these lines are going to move that way. Unless they get chased, I think they're going to stick around and see what happens with those buffaloes. It makes more sense for them to stay, since the buffalo have all but forgotten that the lions are here. It makes more sense to stay and see what happens with the buffalo, because something might happen. The buffalo might get chased, or one might get separated. It's an ambitious meal for three lionesses to take down, but I suppose worth the risk. The others have heard something now, or smelled something. I think heard something, because the wind's coming from behind them. I was thinking now about that leopard claw of Cedric's. Wondering how it would compare to a lion's claw. The basic structure is the same, but obviously a lion's claw would be a lot bigger. Naka, I can't think of any buffalo kills that this particular pride has made recently because there's only three lionesses with the seven cubs and the two evokers, Blondie and Mohawk, aren't always with them. I don't think they've made very many buffalo kills recently. Um, they've definitely made a kudu kill and a nyala kill. The last time I saw these particular ten was just to the west of Treehouse Dam and they had killed a kudu. Or a nyala, one of the two. We didn't get to see the carcass. They'd finished it, unfortunately, by the time we got there. I think it may... Oh, it was a nyala. It was a nyala bull. So that kind of size is much more manageable for the three lionesses to take down. The reason why they wouldn't necessarily go for buffalo all the time is because, as is hunting buffaloes in any pride of lions, is a massive risk. They've got sharp horns, they're incredibly bulky, and they're not particularly scared animals. They will come and chase lions away. And if lions attack one of the members of the herd, the buffalo, the buffalo will come in and attack the lions. They'll move the lines off and chase them off of that animal. So it's very interesting because, you know, it's, it has to be a difficult meal for them to have access to. The only reason they would choose to hunt a buffalo is if there's a really good opportunity. So one separated, maybe a weak one or a young one, or many more adult lions that can actively partake in the hunt because these cubs would not be able to take down a buffalo. It would be very risky and they're a little bit too young. As much as they might help with smaller animals with hunting, 
definitely a buffalo hunt would be a little bit dangerous for them at this point and they just don't have the the lion power to bring a big buffalo down especially not a very strong strapping healthy buffalo so they would go for smaller things kudus nyalas warthogs impalas anything in that kind of range i suppose smaller than a kudu even wildebeest and zebra they would go for but Zebras also have a massively strong kick, so they'd have to be careful with those two. And remember, I mean, the Vokas got injured from hunting buffaloes. And in fact, this pride in the extended form, the extended pride if you include the sub-adults, they've been hunting buffalo and it didn't turn out too well for them. But anyway, we're going to reposition a little bit to see if we can figure out what that lioness keeps looking at. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to see what else we can find in this area because it looks like the lions are going to go back to sleep. What a sight, Tess. Oh, man. I really, really crave a proper lion sighting myself as well. But over here, we've got a beautiful giraffe coming down for some water. <laughs> I keep making this joke and my father really is going to disinherit me. But a, dr a drinking giraffe honestly looks like, you know, when you've got a really sore back or... You, you're in a lot of pain or maybe you're just part of the elderly group and you have to pick up something. You sort of also have to splay your legs. And uh, I always joke with my father saying <laughs> that's what he looks like when he's playing bowls and he has to pick up his bowls. But uh, yes, even a giraffe like this, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful animal. I love them, honestly. But even a pride of lions, you know, if they've got their strategy and everything in order, they can even take down a massive, massive animal such as this one. And of course you can see very very vigilant just to make sure nothing is around or there's no potential threat around that could you know bring any harm to this giraffe whether it be a predator or anything else so they have to make very very sure when they go down to drink water because obviously that puts them in a super vulnerable position shame you can see those ox peckers on him I know Tess had some ox peckers as well earlier with the buffaloes, but that giraffe is just full of ox peckers cleaning it up. Yes, so I'm sitting at Biffelzook Dam and uh, not much, too much happening here at the moment, just listening out. But very interesting that uh, caught my attention is uh, Lisa's father that's playing bowls because uh, my mom is a very big uh, bowls player as well there down in uh, Sedgefield and she loves bowls and I used to play a lot of bowls as well. Yes, I always say it's uh, for, the, uh, for the elderly uh, folks and uh, you know, not for the youngsters and all that but trust me, it is a wonderful, wonderful game and I'm not bad at it. I'm actually quite good at uh, bowls because every time I go and leave I would go and play a little bit of uh, lawn bowls with uh, my mom down in Sedgefield. So Lisa, it would be nice to know if you do play bowls and maybe one day we can uh, have a little bit of a challenge. That'll be quite interesting, but uh, yes. <laughs> but we've got a little bit of southern black, uh, little southern black tits here, sorry, just on top here, on this uh, zizi fus, uh, a buffalo thorn. A little southern black tits that's busy 
chasing each other looks like a, a young male that wants to have a little yellow, yellow breasted canaries on the one side as well, and then these two black tits. Oh, look at that. <laughs> chasing each other all around. Catch him! Catch! Yo! It's amazing how they maneuver themselves around that uh, thorny tree. The little yellow breasted canaries have decided to fly off because these two are too busy. Yo! Like, uh, it's like fighter pilots going through there. Did you get it? Oh, so yeah, some of it. Almost falling off the seat. Oh, sorry, I'm going to go. He's uh, trying to catch it. <laughs> he's, in, he's trying to capture as much as possible there. And he's almost falling off, uh, off the seat here. Oh, wow. How's that looking? Uh, okay, Jan. I don't know if you're going to capture it. You see the little tilapias, the, the school of tilapias, right on the edge. You see that little dark spot there in the water? You can see it. You got it there. I want to see quickly. Nice to see those little tilapias right at the surface. I think I want to know. I think you'll have to go a little bit in from those two little stones. Yeah, that, and it got in. Stone. Yeah, I got in. Exactly. Oh. Up, 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 up. Oh, I thought we might have captured those tilapias, but it's a little bit difficult. Oh, sorry about that. Very difficult. With my naked eye, I could see it. Maybe it's a little bit tough with the camera, but you can see that school actually moving along there. Perfect for the, uh, what you call it, a pied kingfisher if they were here. They would definitely be having a, a blast with those little tilapias that's swimming in the school uh, and right close to the surface as well. But I don't think we see it. Uh, that's all right, John. See that little, oh, there you see that, yeah, see that, yeah, that little black, it's like a shadow inside that water. Yeah, you can actually, actually just in the center there, you can see like a little, a darkish shadow in this. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes we'll have to use our imagination on that one. But yeah, there are definitely quite a few of them there. Uh, thank you very much, Sammy. So you guys see the dark shadow. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian, yo, definitely catfish, tilapia, and catfish. I mean, catfish can survive the, the droughts. So, uh, and the catfish, you know, the catfish, bobble. So definitely find them around, yeah. I don't think, it, look, bream you'll find more in your river areas. Uh, kerpers, not, yeah, I think it hasn't got uh, those reeds. Same as like bass. So kerpers and bass, you'll usually find more if there's a lot of uh, vegetation that's inside the water itself or uh, to shelter those uh, uh, species of fish. But like your tilapias and your catfish, uh, they are very much uh, the ones that you'll find in these <laughs> dams and water holes that starts uh, drying up. And a lot of the tilapias will actually come down uh, via, if there's floods, or even uh, via what, uh, Egyptian geese, for instance. So if Egyptian geese is sitting at, say, for instance, at uh, a Chitwa Dam, and uh, a tilapia uh, lays eggs in, uh, those eggs are very sticky, it's a very sticky substance. And sometimes it'll stick to maybe the legs or uh, the, the, what you call it, the feet of uh, the Egyptian geese. And off the Egyptian geese will go. And of course, once it flies away, that sticky substance will actually harden on the on the feet itself or the legs. And then when it gets to the, another dam, it'll actually deposit those eggs if it goes into the water. And then that's a hull, those uh, tilapias, and that kind of get from one dam to the next dam. So we always think, well. How does things get to Buffelzook Dam? I mean, it goes dry. Some uh, some winter times, this uh, dam is completely dry, and you'll think why. But yeah, that's how that actually gets transported by birds, even by hippos on the back of a hippo. Same thing. It could be stuck to the side of the hippo, back of the hippo, and the hippo's moving from one side to the next side, and got two, three, four eggs attached to that hippo's skin somewhere, and it comes into another water hole. Just deposit those eggs into another water hole. Oh, sounds like a big aeroplane coming towards us. But yes, definitely I would love to know if Lisa will take me up on that challenge. Some bowls, some lawn bowls. It's quite a tough game that stand for a long period of time.
in the sun. Do you play the bowls? Uh, have you ever played, John? I played uh, uh, just on one occasion. We were two down in East London and we went to the local uh, bowls club for meals every evening and the one night we played against them. Oh, did you guys win? Uh, no. It's, it's difficult. Oh, no, it's not easy. No, it's not easy. It looks easy, but to get your weight and your line right, it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a challenge. But nice. I enjoyed it, I really did. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, anywho. So what, do, what are we going to try and do from uh, Buffalo Dam? As you can see, not much is happening except for the two little southern black tits that's been f chasing each other all around you and with me talking about uh, lawn bowls. I think uh, I'm going to head up on Hipper Pools Road. Oh, a bit of a breeze coming. Hipper Pools Road, head towards Cheetah Cut Line, just to take a look if anything crossed further back east into Torchwood. And then, uh, yeah, let's see what else we can find around this area. Alrighty, let's do it. Let's do that. Okay. Oh, little fishies. Wild Earth is paying tribute to our dynasty of leopards with a royal celebration. Come dress for the affair in some of our royal family merch to show your love for these great big cats. You can browse through our leopard shirts on our website and join in the royal gathering from the 1st till the 4th of September. And still on our Cheetah Stakeout here at the Amakala Private Game Reserve. For Malela, she's just moved off a little bit to the side of that bush. And as you can see, folks, the wind is howling. So Morgan needs to stay quite, uh, on quite a wide angle. And just so you know, there are some vehicles around. We called in the sighting, and obviously, this is one of those high profile sightings that everybody wants to come and see so there are vehicles around as well but back to the camera we need to stay on a wide angle because if you zoom in now it's very wobbly with the wind you might even hear the roof flapping around 
so just understand that's why we're not zooming in but I'm hoping that a little bit later on in the afternoon this wind drops off nicely and then in that golden hour light before sunset it's going to be wonderful if they get up and start walking they have been doing that pretty much every day so I'm expecting nothing different today so we will remain on the cheetah stakeout until hopefully that happens normally when I grab a cup of coffee and a muffin and sit and wait it out. We've also backed ourselves into a bit of a bush to try and get out of the wind but we're a lot bigger than these cheetahs so not as easy as them to find cover. It must be about a 40 kilometer wind at the moment, so it is pretty strong. Coming from the west, sort of southwest. Austin, um, the, the, these two, male and female, it's uh, very difficult to tell them apart. They're not differing in size much at all now, it's, uh, they're pretty much the same. A little bit later the the male will start to sort of get a little bit bigger um, and then it's easier to tell so I would say after about a year year and a year and a half more so with an, with that extra six months then you can start to see more of a difference between them there pumalela has got up but I think she might just be getting disturbed by the wind I think she's probably just gonna join the other two now and cuddle up Maybe there'll be a bit of grooming. Yeah, as I thought. Nice bit of contact there. It's mommy and youngster. Social bonding is also sort of imparted when, when they groom each other like that. It's just, you know, establishing, re-establishing their bonds as with any kind of tactile contact. Londa, um, I'm not quite sure if these cubs will be named. That will be all down to the Amakala management. They've they've named the the mom Pumlela, um, and that would all be down to them. You know, sometimes like with the leopards, they do wait um, to see if they are going to name them. The decision will be made around whether they're going to be staying on the reserve or not. You know, what happens here is. There, there is a national database with Panthera um, because it's very important for the genetics, especially with uh, cheetah in particular. If you have them on the reserve, because you see now there's, it seems one, one boy and one girl, or male and female youngsters, and if these three had to be left, it would land up that that male will mate with his mother and his sister so that would then dilute massively in the gene pool so in this particular part of south africa and it does happen with other reserves as well they then have it sort of a trading or a swapping system where another reserve will be looking for a male or a female they mainly look for females um, and then if you've got a male to swap with them or whatever and that all needs to be cleared with the Panthera um, website uh, well the, the the guys that manage that and they'll 
then check all the blood lines and make sure that it's that they're they're as far as part apart as as possible to ensure that the strength of the genes remains as i say otherwise you start really diluting um with mother and sister being mated with by a son and a brother uh, yeah from there it, it it you know you can almost um destroy this this entire bloodline so um, there's a lot of management around that and the reserves do uh, and have to um, partake in that in that particular uh, management there yeah, she's up but I think she's just getting herself a better spot maybe she'll walk on she's gonna break cover yeah, it looks like she might the stake out has done its job. Now, she might continue on over the ridge here. She's walking into the wind, which always bodes well for hunting. And we're just going to stick with her as long as we can. So folks, there will be a bit of movement of the vehicles now. They try to keep up with her. We're just going to stay still for now. Now, Teddy, yes, cheetah are sociable cats. Um, second only to the lions. There we have some folks jumping into frame. They're just going past. Um, so yes, they are sociable. Second only to lions. Um, you can have, I think the most that is recorded on history, and I actually saw them, the five musketeers in the Masai Mara, four, five males, um, and they stuck together, hunting together, it was fantastic to see. But this is quite common, where you have the mother with her youngsters. Um, and so not truly sociable, like or gregarious like uh, lions are where they form massive prides up to, sometimes up to 30 plus in the super prides but um, yeah they are still a sociable cat So not too long and I'm going to have to start up and get following them. This is what we wanted to see because now we might get nice and close to them. Just remember that the wind is howling. So initially it might be quite difficult unless they turn with their backs to the wind. But I assume that they're going to continue on going into the wind. That's how she will be hunting. And with it being quite uh, fresh, the wind, it actually bodes well for hunting because the animal's uh, definitely upwind of her, can't smell her, and it also sort of deadens any smell, uh, uh, sound too, because you can't hear much in this pretty strong wind. So it's a good time to hunt, as it would be in the rain, also deadens the smell and the sound. So the cheetahs now, all three of them, disappearing out of view and it's nearly time for us to go and catch up with them. Okay, dogs. so time for us to get on the move and catch up with Pumulela and her potentially hunting youngsters. Maybe they will show us something special today. Maybe what they've learned from mommy. While we get on the move, let's head you on back up to Cedric, who's also on the move. All right, so I've done the cut lines, I've done Biffelzook boundary, Oak, uh, Biffelzook dam. I'm coming down to the cut line now. I am going to try and go along Mamba Road uh, to see if anything's up at uh, Mamba Road. Uh, uh, hi there. 
So yes, we just uh, passed uh, Christine and uh, Valerie once again. Looks like uh, uh, yeah, we're bumping into each other all the time. Our ticket to dream guests. Fantastic. <laughs> but yeah, I'm on Mamba Road. I'm heading straight towards uh, uh, Molawati side. Get to Molawati. I think we're going to look at Treehouse Dam, Treehouse Dam and uh, Hyena Den then. Just to break it up a bit and give it a little bit of time just to kind of uh, I think the weather's still too hot just to uh, cool down a little bit more let the sun go down and um, I think then I shall and then I'll go that side and go see again where the last tracks of Columba was this morning so I'll sort of try and get it there. Okay. And our elephants here, eh? I thought I was going to have a bit of a view of the yeah, elephants somewhere. Ew. What is that? Hyena tracks, hyena tracks. Alright, well, hyena tracks are going that side, so I'll definitely end up going to the hyena den. Let's see which characters are around for the afternoon. Actually, it feels like my face is getting burnt today. It's like the, it feels like the sun is a little bit sharp. Yo, I don't usually get burnt on my face and my skin, but today is a little bit strange. All the little young shoots slowly but surely coming out of some of the trees and that. Uh, the guari bushes, you can see the little, almost like little berries that's uh, appearing again. It's amazing that uh, this winter that everything stayed quite, uh, quite a few of the trees stayed quite green throughout this year. And uh, I think the water table and the water underneath uh, the ground is quite high at this point of time and I wonder if this summer if we're going to get good drains I'm sure that water is not, it's not going to take much for the water just to sit on top of the roads again and on top of the ground itself Affected by the strong sun and especially summertime will be your hippos. I think hippos, the epidermis, the skin itself on the hippos is very, uh, very sensitive uh, to sun. That's why you'll find. Oh no, sorry, I just went off a little bee eater. Man, it just flew off there. And that's why the hippos always have to really keep their skin nice and wet and uh, and always ending up in the waters during the daytime when it's hot. Is to make sure that that skin is moisturized by the by the dams and the rivers and wherever they are relaxing okay. uh, sorry Jordan any luck there yeah um, there's one adult Okay, copy. I'm going to take that sandbar then. Thank you. Alright. Alright, we are going to go towards the Molawati, so we might lose a little bit of signal here. Yeah? So we're just going to take a look how the signal plays out for us. I am keeping my eyes open and still very much peeled for any other signs of tracks for Columba but I think I've got a feeling she's northern side northern side of Juma but as I said I'm gonna wait for it just to cool down a little bit more so I can actually go and comb a little bit easier through that area Uh, well, if, uh, Vic, 
Lucky, I'm sure there's a few. I mean, got crocodiles that need uh, waters. You know, cricket crocodiles need to be around the water areas. Uh, Elephants as well. So, uh, um, buffaloes, a lot of animals that uh, really kind of depend on water during the daytime to go and have a drink. So there's a lot of animals around there that enjoys that kind of stuff. So, but usually hippos and crocodiles is your main things. A bit of the bigger animals around that really enjoy and need that water. Uh, Standing by. No, I'm just saying that thank you. All right, we are going in the Mulawati, so let's see how the signal goes. Hopefully, we're not going to lose the signal. I'll try and get to the hyena den. Maybe Rusty will work. Maybe she'll stand. I don't know. Oh, I've got a little female in the eye. A couple of them inside. Uh, Oh, that's awesome, Cedric. Very, very exciting. Hope you have lots and lots of luck. Currently, we are back at the beautiful Mashatu watering hole. And we've actually had quite a few animals today that have visited the watering hole. We've had elephants a couple of times. We've had the crocodile who's still around. We've had giraffes, impalas, zebras, wildebeest, guinea fowl, monkeys. So we've really had quite the safari just by being stationary at the watering hole, which is very, very exciting.
My apologies. This is a lesser spotted pole. <laughs> I'm going to take us back to the watering hole just now. My apologies for that. We are back at Juma with a dam cam over here. And we just had Dewey in the watering hole. Just want to see what he's up to. There he is, Dewey the Hippo, who many of you know, Woo. showing off his beautiful, beautiful teeth. How beautiful and impressive is that? Honestly, hippos are one of my favorite animals to just observe because sometimes they can do nothing and then all of the sudden they can just absolutely give you such an impressive show and treat us to that of course and of course this is a very very interactive experience we are live and we would love to hear from all of you if you have any questions comments suggestions about us about the reserves the animals please send those to us you can go to wildearth.tv forward slash questions or you're more than welcome to scan the qr code at the bottom of your screen So I think for me personally, one of the most impressive things about hippo, if you look at a hippo, it's a massive, massive animal, just like a buffalo and a rhino. Those animals have very long gestations. For instance, a rhino is pregnant, as we would call it, for 15 months. An elephant carries their young for 22 months. A hippo, even though there are these massive animals, only gestate for eight months which is very very odd to me when i was studying field guiding i honestly had to check and recheck that fact because <laughs> for me that was just unbelievable i did not buy it i was like no this can't be true have you seen the size of these animals and yet they only gestate for such a short period oh wow dewey man that's incredible And what's very impressive to me right now is the fact that, well, not from what I know or can see, but there are no other animals around. Neither is a vehicle or anything he should be 
showing those teeth to. So he's literally just treating us to a beautiful scenery. All right, well, while I enjoy Dewey the Hippo at Juma, I am going to send you back over to Tse's and we'll see what she has in store for us. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. We have got a very cute little scene playing out here. We left the lines, as you can tell. These are definitely not lines, and they were definitely not at any water. We've decided to have a quick pop in at Chitwa Dam to see what's happening around here. And lo and behold, there is a teeny weeny weeny baby crocodile currently being stalked by a green backed heron or a striated heron. How tiny is that crocodile to compare that to the size of that little heron? This is a new little hatchling. We've been trying to work out if this might be one of the same ones. Remember, there were three baby crocodiles in Chitwa Dam a few months ago already. We're trying to work out if it's the same ones or if it's different ones, but I feel like this might be a different set because it's so tiny still. And baby crocodiles can grow up to 30 centimeters in their first year. And I don't feel like the other ones were this small. I feel like they were a little bit bigger. Hey, Panda? Yeah. No, I think this one's smaller. So this might be a new litter of hatchlings from our crocodiles at Chitwa Dam. Very exciting stuff. The heron decided it was a bit camera shy, so it's left the premises, but that's okay. The baby crocodile is very cute. So believe it or not, this little thing, by the time it gets to two years old, is going to be taller than my hip height, around 1.2 meters. Right now, as a hatchling, they're about 15 centimeters long. Right now, I would say it's probably close to close to 15 or 20. It is very small. It's definitely smaller than a ruler length. But you can see it's got absolutely gorgeous markings. They've got very bright markings down their sides and you can clearly see those light and dark patches on the scales down its side. It's very exciting to see a new little baby crocodile. So it's in fact the same log where the other ones used to come and perch out of the water and this is really good for safety because a little baby crocodile like that in the water is a pretty good prey source for a lot of different animals but up on the log it camouflages really well. It's also ectothermic so it's, it's what we would term cold-blooded although that's not actually the best term for it. So it's trying to warm up as well before night, nightfall. But it's also just a little bit safer. Something like an eagle, though, might come down and try and take that. Scary. Now, crocodiles don't have a particularly good... a particularly good um, success rate when it comes to hatchlings. Only about one in 50 crocodiles that hatches will make it to adulthood. So that's why we don't really see altogether that many babies. When they're freshly hatched, they are an excellent prey source. Oh, the heron has made a return. Look at that. That is a perfect comparison. That crocodile is just about as long as that heron poised, ready to strike. That is unreal. Oh, there's a cute little jump. Well captured, Thunder. Let's see if it's going to get anything. see it is absolutely ready to strike right now. So the light luckily for us is just perfect. It's starting to become golden because it's approaching the horizon now. And so those colors, you can really see those markings on this heron. Those colors are quite beautiful. That yellow, especially just in front of the eye, is quite striking. So in total size, when it's standing upright, a green bacterium is around 40 to 41 centimeters tall. 
So that's quite difficult to compare, I suppose, height to length. But if you try and imagine the heron on its side, I suppose, then you could try and compare it to the size of the crocodile. But they're about, oof, I don't know, in that view the crocodile looks a bit bigger. <laughs> they're much of a muchness, I suppose, lengthwise. Not talking about the height of the heron, lengthwise. This is a really cute little sighting. I absolutely love it. I think we got lucky today with a little baby crocodile. I don't think this little crocodile is going to go anywhere, but you never know. Maybe we might see it plop back into the water if the hippos get too close or something. Unbelievable to be here with Tristan today. Tristan and Gert have made me feel very, very much at ease and at home on the vehicle. Wendy, Ribbon is a favourite for most people. I've followed Ribbon the last two and a bit years. The interaction between Clamber and her cubs and the, the way they played with one another and then would switch to, to grooming them, that was just magical to watch. And um, we're having an absolute blast. I would recommend getting a ticket to Dream if you can make it happen. So we're going to see if this little baby hippo climbs back onto its mom's back. I need to reposition just a little bit because there is a vehicle that's going to need to come past us just now. So Panda will probably stay on the dam, but I'm going to just reposition a little bit so that the vehicle can come past us when they need to. That should do. <laughs> Oh, I love Chitwood Dam, it's always so productive. So the little family of hippos decided to come closer to the baby crocodile. And I don't think they would come as far as the log itself, purely because it's quite difficult for them to move through the weeds sometimes, but there's also no need for them to do it. They probably can't see the crocodile from where they are. I think they were more actually curious about us and decided to come and see because we've been sitting here for a while, decided to come and see why we're here. Maybe we're an early detection system for another predator or something. 
but the little baby crocodile has not moved a muscle. It's quite expected though, I suppose it is. It is really tiny. It's got a very comfortable spot. It's kind of dug its claws into the side. They've got very sharp claws. <coughs> and it's dug its claws into the side of the log so that it doesn't accidentally slip off. But crocodiles, like other reptiles, are very well known for sitting exceptionally still for a very long time. They are ambush predators. So even if they're not hunting, they're still really good at sitting still. Partially to do with warming up the body, but also to do with not wasting energy. So I don't know if you knew this, but we won't be able to tell if this is male or female for a while. But um, the sex of crocodile babies is determined by the temperature at which they are incubated. So females are at lower temperatures, males are at higher temperatures. So I wonder what this one will be. But anyway, it sounds like Cedric's just arrived at the hyena den. So let's go and have a look if there's any hyena clan action. Yes, it's nice just to come back here to uh, the Juma clan den, as you've got in Dabele, just uh, resting with her two little cubbies, enjoying the cubbies, and all the cubbies enjoying some milk. Of course, uh, suckling there from mommy. And just behind in Dabele, we've got a koa that's just chewing on... I don't know what she's chewing on. Chewing on something there. I see that. I'm trying to see what she's chewing on. Maybe like a stick. What are you doing on there, Koa? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Koa belongs to uh, Corky. That's Corky's youngster. Oh, look, it is a stick. <laughs> oh, you little ones. You are so adorable. And then in the background, we've got Masangita. That's got the back face to us. And then with most, I can't see from here, but it's Loki and Kira, one of Intima's cubs as well, that's resting there with Masangita. I wonder why my radio keeps on jumping too funny things here. Yeah? Just trying to change. There we go. Yeah, so that's the so I don't see any other adults. I thought there might have been uh, Swazi. Oh, oh, look who's in front of us here. Oh, oh, can you actually see this little one here? Yeah, sorry. Hello, looks like Loki. Oh, hello, Loki. As I, I think it looks like Loki, so he's like... Yeah. Yeah, he's just, uh, just uh, enjoying the chillness of uh, Rusty being here. You know, Loki and Kira, they love the, the two landies. And when they pull up here, they always are very excited. Oh, oh. Koa, Koa's like... Gonna maybe... Yeah, I had like a stick. Yeah, see so, you now look at Loki and Kira. So Loki and Kira went to quickly investigate on what uh, Koa was uh, bringing up there. And I don't know what she's got there. It looks like a piece of maybe a skin. Yeah, it might be skin of some sort of animal. I'm not too sure what. But you can see they are chewing on that. So I'm going to quickly try and get my bifocals out here. Yeah? I'm trying to see. But Koa was not happy there. It was almost... Uh, it's, it's, sorry, it is also my fault. It's not code, sorry, it's Masangita. So it's Masangita on the left. Sorry, Ko is at the background. My fault? Oh, Masangita. So that's Swazi's cub. What's this pulling the poor little one now? Oh. Tima, it seems like every time in Tima's cubs are getting always beaten by well, the, the other cubs. <laughs> the one just took the skin now. <laughs> well, Miss Ngita was too busy pulling on the one's uh, fur there. The other one decided to grab a little piece of skin there. 
Even the Bella's uh, uh, eyes, that saw looks good on her head now, eh? Really healing quite well. Stick. It's mine. to investigate on what that little one is busy eating. What is that? It looks like Kira strenuous on a bone. That's really good for the teeth as well. But it's amazing as you can see it uh, with uh, Kira she is yes now I did correct myself earlier on uh, thank you very much I did uh, correct myself a little bit earlier on with the Masangita and Loki and Kira that was playing around there with that stick or there was a piece of skin or something right at the back is cover Of course, I'm still enjoying that little bit of uh, chewing at the background. But I think at the end of the day, um, I'm looking at Masangita that's uh, sitting far, far back left that's chewing on that uh, branch at the back end there. And uh, remember, Masangita is a month younger than Loki and Kira. That's in Timas Cubs. And also a month younger than Koa. And Koa is standing now in front here. It's busy sniffing the ground. And Masangita's, honestly, she's, to me, she looks larger and fitter than the three of them. If you actually look at them when they're standing next to each other. So, maybe, maybe Kira, Loki, and, uh, and, uh, Koa could be males, and Masangita female. And, uh, just throwing it out there, but I'm not going to say, <laughs> just, uh, the speculations. The speculation is always not a good thing because we know what happened to Swazi. So, actually, uh, <laughs> yeah. But yes, as you know, it is a leopard fest that is coming up from the 1st to the 4th of uh, September. And this is to celebrate uh, 
uh, our royal family of uh, Juma, of all the leopards of uh, Juma. And throughout the sunset shows on these days, we will be taking a trip down memory lane and playing out sightings from our archi uh, archives starting as far back as when Queen Karula reigned here at, of course, uh, Juma. If you are a long-time uh, Wild Earth viewer, we would love to hear from you as to what clip you would like to see played out. If you can add a date and even a link where possible, that would be great. Uh, try and see if you can add any links or even clips with the date, with your name on it as well. So we know where it came from. So you just have to send those video clips to an email address that is leopards at wildearth.tv. So again, leopards at wildearth.tv. So please send those links, those dates, and what you would like to see from, uh, of course, the Juma leopards from backing or backdating to the days of the Queen Karula. So that's of course Tandi and of Natlalamba, any of those uh, amazing uh, leopards that we've been viewing over so many years here at uh, Juma Private Game Reserve. There's something in the back coming. Maybe another Another hyena. Uh, oh, yeah, comes another hyena. Maybe Swazi. Looks like. Let me take a look quickly with my bifocals. Yeah, looks like Swazi coming in there. What is hyenas? Are all gonna, the lions are going to run? Uh, looks like in Tima. Oh, <laughs> look at the lions running. I always get a fright. Uh, it looks like in Tima, eh? Yeah, it's in Tima. Hello. Yes, see, there's our Loki and Kira's uh, mom. No, no, it's not. Sorry. Yes, my bad. No, I just want to say, look at it. It's Corky. It's Corky. Can you see there? I can't see you. I'm trying to say, I don't have to get the screen out, sorry, I'm a bit behind you in the bush. Uh, guess where it is? It's ribbon. Yeah. yeah. I can't see nicely. I'm trying to see. No, oh, there's Corky. Hey, Corks, what's up? What's happening, girl? Where's your, where's Koa? So Koa is going to be very happy that her mom is here. So, of course, this is Corky now. Hello. Where's Koa? Oh, Koa wants to suck. Okay, Koa's at the bottom. There's Koa. All yeah, right. So, 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 of course, uh, Corky is uh, the matriarch of the Juma clan. So this uh, female is pretty much known. She's got one of the highest ranks, or if not the highest ranked, of the Juma clan. Yeah, well, we're going to sit a little bit longer Yeah, I think we also have to make space for others. Let's head over to Amakala. I think that Ralph has got some other spots to show everybody. Well, our spots are mobile and they've been zigzagging through these thickets in the very strong wind and a moment ago it seemed like they spotted something like a rodent just disappearing out of the bushes and they did a little chase but then uh, it obviously disappeared down a hole or something and now they're just zigzagging again opportunistically seeing if they can spot anything in these thickets as they move. So they've gone out of view now, but uh, this is the whole thing. Now we've sort of got to just try and keep up with them the whole time. 
and hopefully we get to see them chasing and catching something I'm really hoping so and I'm also hoping that this wind drops as the Sun drops with it it's very windy it's not easy especially for the cameraman Just moving through those thorns there now. And I think they're completely out of view now. It's always difficult when you can't drive off road as well. So we always got to think which road we can take to get in front of them and then let them walk towards us, anticipating that's the best but uh, they've been circling back doubling around and doing all sorts so you try and anticipate where they're going and meanwhile they walk back to where they started and it seems now they have disappeared Somewhere I just saw the back of one, but it's really in the thickets there. Fred, they do need to eat quite regularly, um, they're growing animals, so if mom can catch for them every day, they will eat every day, but they'll obviously take what they can get, they, they can't go for longer than a few days without food, so she needs, she's got her job cut out for her, they are however starting to sort of, you know, do a little bit of hunting, you can see that they're very interested in all sorts of things as it runs out of the bushes or whatever when when they're walking and I do have a feeling that um, here in this part of the Eastern Cape you do get a lot of spring hares jumping around at night and I, I believe that they're eating lots of that um, they have been eating but then it's nothing substantial and that's what leads me to that fact scrub hares spring hares more so because spring hares are so uh, they're pretty slow and they I would say very easy to catch um, especially for a cheetah so I think at night um, we're not witnessing it but that's what I believe they are feeding predominantly on at the moment um, Morgan and Lauren they did see them get a young springbok there was also some of the other guides that saw them get another young springbok um, and as soon as more springboks start being born I'm sure that they'll eat a lot more of that as well but I think now for the time being their diet probably consists of rodents whether it be mice or gerbils and spring hares which are also rodents and then scrub hares maybe as well so that's why they're walking through these thickets um, and I do know that the other guides have also witnessed uh, Pumalela nail a uh, young warthog so I think it's all those smaller things nothing substantial that's gonna fill their bellies up I haven't seen them having a full belly since I've got here so but I've seen her defecating a number of times uh, I think we just saw her a little bit earlier it was either a wee or a poo but um so she is passing which means she is eating but as I say the belly doesn't show anything substantial for my um, understanding A 
Ashley, yeah, the the youngsters. Um, it, it, it's it's always different with all the different individuals of cheetah. But what I found in my experience, it's more the mom that leaves them. They they're quite happy to stay in the comfort of mom. Uh, doing a lot of the hunting, more experienced, she's better at it. Um, and eventually it's her that leaves because of her hunger and also her sort of um, uh, willing to, to go and find another mate or and, and, and just get away from them. Um, because as I say, they dominate the kills uh, and take most of the food. So she then moves off so that she can, she can kill something and, and have the lion's share, if I can say that. Um, so, yeah, in my experience, it's more the, the female that leaves the youngsters on their own, uh, more than the youngsters leaving the adult. But I've, I've seen that as well, but it's, it's more weighted towards the adult leaving. It's normally after they're pretty well established hunters as well. So it's a real learning curve with cheetah. They, they do, they're not natural at it immediately. Um, and that's why when you have rehabilitated or injured cheetah, they lose that ability completely. So the fitness that is um, involved, firstly, um, the muscle memory, um, the chase, everything that's involved. So when, when they are rehabilitated, they do need to be taught how to hunt again. Um, with lions and leopards, they can be easier to release after they've been rehabilitated because the hunger just gets them and, and, and they have the ability to learn on their own. So cheetah, slightly different where they, they need to literally be taught. Sign up to be an explorer and stand a chance to win a three-night stay for two in the Mashatu Tented Camp in Botswana. Mashatu is the home to our beloved Escape to Nature webcam that brings you some of our best footage daily. Discover the meandering pathways to platform-mounted tents sheltered within the hush of trees and share a meal overlooking our abundant waterhole before heading out on a safari for even more incredible wildlife. Yes, uh, so nice just to still be sitting here at the Zen Den. I'm zenning out here and I'm just watching old Koa suckling. The Koa just enjoying a good old suckling here from uh, Mom, Corky, Mother Corky. Oh, what are those two? Hmm? That one's Masangita's full of beans outside. 
I'm full of beans. Masangita and looks like uh, like your Kira. So Masangita's, <laughs> but she's or well, he, she. He, I'm not too sure, but always. But oh, don't pull the ear. No, oh, not not pulling the mohawk now. <laughs> oh no, not the mohawk. Oh no, it's the ear. I love the ears, don't I? But then you can see the size. Look at Masangita. She's quite quite staunch. Almost a little bit bigger than uh, uh, looks like. Oh, yo. Inna. That is rough play. They are tough. Yes. Uh, Masangita is very oof oof. Uh, Masangita is very dominant, as a as a one of the cubs. Yeah, she's one of the more dominant ones. I've been witnessing quite a bit on her, and just watching her really dominating Loki and Kira, as you can see. Yeah, and I mean Loki and Kira is younger than I mean older than she is, uh, or he is. I'm really calling it a she. Mm, it's gonna be sore. It's gonna be sore. All right, well, we're not, uh, we have to start making our way out. There's another vehicle that's going to be coming in here. So let's head over to Tess to see what's happening on her safari. <laughs> Cedric, I'm so happy that you got a bit of rough and tumble action at the den. That is always a good way to spend any safari. Now we've gone from one form of spots to another. This is a leopard orchid in flower at Chitwa Dam. And it is slightly blowing in the breeze, which is quite beautiful. It's a bit mesmerizing to watch, but the little spots, which you can't see really well at the moment, are actually tiny little brown colored spots on those yellow petals. Now this is an unusual orchid. It's the largest in the orchid family and named very appropriately a leopard orchid because it's spotted and because it's up in trees. It's called an aerophyte, which is quite unusual for plants, getting all of your nutrients and things that you need from yourself and from the air. It's literally just using this tree as a, a stand, if you want to put it that way, to get higher up into the breeze. But we actually stopped here not just for the leopard orchid because it is beautiful to look at and they only flower for a short time per year but also because there was a massive family of guinea fowls that were running around at the bottom oh and now there's those two starlings look like they're nesting up there sorry slight distraction we've done a u-turn looks like those starlings might be nesting there on that little broken section they both stuck their heads into a hollow there before coming back out maybe they've got a nest those are Birchall starlings, so that's the biggest one in the family. Wow, I wonder if they've got a nest. It would be very cool to see if they come and bring food in. We must monitor that. Maybe we'll even see chicks fledging sometime. Very, very cool. Time for a bit of a preen of those pretty iridescent feathers. All right, I'll keep watching that situation. Maybe if we come back regularly, we must check and see if there's action in and out of the nest. But before all of the guinea fowl disappear, I do want to show them to you because they are quite unusual dinosaur looking ground birds. They run a bit like a velociraptor. They've still got the very prehistoric looking head and they're quite tough to see, but they're in the background all around this tree. So you can see they're moving across there at the edge of the dam, in amongst some elephant dung, in amongst the shorter grass. They don't really like the long grass much because they're looking for little tidbits of food in the short grass where it's easier to see. And the sun at the moment is catching that really scaly section on the face, so that section doesn't have feathers. And that's why it's called the helmeted guinea fowl. It looks like it's wearing a blue and red helmet, and that's the part that you can really see in the sun. So it's one of the easiest ways to spot guinea fowl because with the mottled grayish color of the body it it makes it a lot more difficult to spot them. 
there you can see from a distance they blend in incredibly well until they turn their head to the side and then you see that flash of light blue. Quite a sleek looking bird but in reality they're a pretty bulky bird. They're quite heavy and they're not the best flyers. <laughs> it sounds awful to say but it's the truth they're not the best flyers and um, they're quite well known for reacting very quickly so they're always in these big groups and if one of the birds reacts to something all of them react and they they almost seem like they're panicking quite easily but all it is is it's that early detection system and they're using it to their advantage and they'd rather with fight or flight they'd rather choose flight and they make quite a noise when they're doing it so it's it can be quite entertaining to watch they can be a pretty good indicator of things like leopards for example if there was one here they would not be on the ground they would be making a noise up in a tree but you can see they're quite nicely spread out which shows they're pretty relaxed this afternoon if they were feeling a bit threatened they'd be in one solid group because one in 20 is much less of a chance of being eaten than one in five if you're spread out. And I'm sure you all know this is one of Marib's favorite snacks. He's particularly fond of guinea fowl. Oh, look at that blue on the face. So it's interesting, they've been in amongst the lapwings as well, and there were some Egyptian geese that were kind of coming in and out of the background. But they don't seem to mind each other. Well, there you can see the blacksmith lapwing in the background, but not the geese. Sarah, yes, guinea fowls are edible and it's not just to Maribs and other similar minded predators. Humans can eat guinea fowls as well. In fact, Panda and I were just talking about it, but guinea fowls are incredibly tough. So it's not the most pleasant meat to eat, but they are edible. So you would be able to eat them. It just might not be the most pleasant experience. It's not going to be tender like, I suppose, a chicken. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just difficult to prepare. But I'm sure you can imagine, you know, this, this would be almost considered like a game bird, I suppose, if you want to look at it that way. So, you know, people over the many, many years that have been in Africa, people have, of course, made many a meal of guinea fowl if they need to. I'm not sure whether guinea fowl eggs would be that edible. It wouldn't work the same way as normal eggs, you know, because normal eggs are produced specifically for that. So they're not fertilized. So I don't know if you'd be able to eat guinea fowl eggs. I'm sure you would because you can eat ostrich eggs. Obviously, that's just a lot bigger. But um, you'd have to catch it in the early stages, I suppose, as the egg is laid. I think it got a fright when the hippo made a noise. I don't know if you could hear the hippo. It blew air out really quickly, but that guinea fowl got a fright and lifted its head at the same time. Very prehistoric looking birds. Now, these are also pretty popular in local cultures because guinea fowls are quite a common presence. Their feathers have been used for jewelry. They're often painted in, in a lot of traditional paintings. So it's a very popular and common bird. I did not hear what Sammy said. I'm so sorry. Panda, did you hear what she said? Sorry, Sammy. You might have to repeat that for me. I did not hear what she said. Hello, bee fowls. So I'm trying to think. I'm fairly sure when I was younger, I had almost like a wind charm kind of thing that had little wooden guinea fowls. I'm fairly sure it was little wooden giddy fowls painted on it and it was absolutely beautiful. It was one of those things that they sell, you know, around the parks and things like that. I loved it. But anyway, it sounds like Ralph is still with his cheetah family, so let me not carry on about guinea fowls and rather send you over to Amakala for some different spots. Well, we've managed to catch up with them, get out on the other side, and they've broken cover. So wonderful to see them out in the open. They're still pretty cold. They're all cuddled up now. 
doing a bit of grooming. Oh, Kumalela's up. She wants something to eat. I can see it. She might walk right past the vehicle. And as she does, and goes past us, sorry for the poles, but we'll try and follow all of them. There comes the sun, beautiful colors. Youngsters not far behind. It's just awesome to see these youngsters. Um, so close and in this golden light now like I said it's starting to get beautiful now it seems to be that the female is the one that hangs a little bit further back the males up and with Pumlela almost immediately when she moves Does seem also a little bit more wary, does the female. So awesome, that is amazing, I like that. Definitely on the hunt, on the lookout for anything that moves. A lot of the times with hunting, it's it's um, just down to opportunism and random. Wherever they walk, they sort of just zigzag. So, Ronnie, obviously, mostly when they collar different animals, they want to choose um, dominant animals within a group. Um, obviously, in this kind of situation, just collaring the mother um, is the easiest way and, and they obviously did that when, when they released them on the reserve um, and now that the two cubs are there it's you know for now it's pretty easy to know wherever the mother is the the nchonchos as they call them here the youngsters um, are gonna be nearby so if they find her they find the youngsters with for instance like the elephants um, they prefer not to do females, but if they had to collar a female, it, they would normally do a, a matriarch. But that is very stressful for the for the rest of the herd because you'd have to put the herd down, um, so anesthetize her, and in that stage she can she can actually be killed by the rest of the herd once she rejoins um, because of that sort of that they would have assumed that she was dying um, so there can be chaos so that they, they try not to do females it's mainly bulls that they'll do especially when they're solitary they're on their own and they can drop that animal with no stress to the rest of the herd with lions it's also sort of when they release them or if they do want to collar um, they can generally uh, dart all of the lions even if they're just collaring one for instance um, but you know for the, for similar reasons so they often do that
Wow, Rolf, those cheetahs are really just something. Honestly, I think we've been so lucky this whole week, but uh, today specifically with all of the beautiful animals we've gotten to obs observe. I am still with Dewey. We are having a fat chat about, you know, what he does during the day, what his teeth cleaning routine is, what kind of toothpaste he uses, because I mean, if you show off your teeth that much, you surely, you know, you're obviously advertising for something or maybe he's trying to pr impress a girl that we don't know of. Or uh, maybe there's perhaps another male he might be trying to intimidate. But I highly doubt that because we would have seen the other male by now. Just beautiful. This beautiful boy is about to do something for us. But you can see he's in a very sort of playful mood right now. So generally this time of day, hippos will get more active. Woo! As it is obviously starting to cool down now. But hippos are also grazers. So during the night time, they come out. They mark their territory move from watering hole to watering hole if need be whether it be for female or for food resources or of course their watering hole having dried up but generally this time is when you start seeing them being a bit more active but he's being especially active for us today she's and he's just had a whole family of ox pickers <laughs> there's only so much so much of his head available but they've decided no no let's go for the ears get some food give this guy a massage while we can and then all right we'll see the rest of you later <laughs> Oh, well done, Dewey. You are just really spoiling us today. What an incredible, incredible sight. Woo! He truly is very playful today. This one's looking at me very strange. Hmm? You know, Cape Tufflers. Not the oldest, but only a youngish male, maybe about a 10, 11, 12 year old male. As you know, buffaloes get up to around about 25 years old. Uh, but he's still a youngster. Got nice horns on him. So, yes, this is the same herd I think that uh, Tess had. And I think what they did. Someone from, something like that big branch broke there. I think they came all the way west towards or southwest, uh, southeast towards a Treehouse Dam. I think they came to have a little bit of a, a drink at Treehouse Dam. Unfortunately, we did miss that. And it looks like now they're moving back west again. 
I also got confirmation from some of the guides now as well that it sounds like uh, the two evoker males, uh, Blondie and Mohawk, is just south inside Hoffman. So exactly where we found the Unkuhumas and the Seven Cubs this morning, um, they are not too far south from there. And if uh, these buffaloes head back west now, they're going to go towards Shabamu, not too far north of Gary Main, and uh, you never know. Maybe some action again, but oof, look at this boy. Hey, that is a nice male. Is it the same one? No, it's not the same one. The other one's left. Yeah, I was about to say, look at the boss on his head. Absolutely like a helmet. Of course, they use that many times to do sparring, so if they do challenge each other for female for picking rights in these uh, herds, actually, that boss needs to be nice and strong and thick to really challenge each other, but what's happening? I see a lot of crashing down there, hey? Hear that? Yeah. Maybe like two males that's busy sparring somewhere in the, the thickets, yeah. Having horn fights. Oh, that is an ass boy. A big male like this can easily get close to a ton, so 900 kgs up to a ton, and females will be about around about 700 kgs, 700 kilograms. Oh, and you can see the female there on the left. You can see see the differences with the horns. I'm sure you heard about the females' horns are much thinner compared to those males. Easy way to distinguish between the two agendas. This one's pregnant. Look how she, look how big she is. You see this one here? I think she's pregnant. Look how wide she is. Of course, the gestation period for uh, Cape Buffalo is you're looking at around about 11 months. So, and I look at that, look at that belly on her. She is definitely carrying her calf inside there. Nice and wide and very big. This is gestation around 11 months. Now they're going north, looking at the direction now, north, west, northwest. So now they're heading a little bit northwest. No, no, you can't see them now, that's a little one. That's, oh, hey, look at that little thing. Oh, sweet. Hello. Hello, little ones coming out there now, maybe like several months old. And these little ones are coming through. So they'll graze for quite some time now for the afternoon, late afternoon. I finish having a drink at Treehouse Dam and graze a little bit more. And you'll find sometimes I'll try and find little open clearings to go and rest. You know, like a little bit of an open clearing. They don't want too thick vegetation. Uh, they don't want to get surprised by lions. At least the more open it is, the more they can see and the further they can see. That's a big herd. I still think about two, between 200 and 250 in this herd. Definitely, it's quite a huge herd, this. You think you've seen all of them and then there's more that comes through the bush. And more appears and... Mm -mm. 
don't get a fright, then why are you going that way? No, no. I don't have to get a fright. Well, all of a sudden they're getting frights now. Maybe... I think maybe... Maybe that little bit of a bleat. Letting the others know that they're still coming. And just had a little bit of a scare, maybe because of the other vehicle that just came in. While we sit here with these beautiful, stunning Cape buffaloes, please, if you've got any comments, questions that you want to send through, go onto our website, that is wildearther.tv, and just go onto our questions page, and then, of course, you can send those comments and questions through, or else just scan the QR code in, it appears at the bottom of the screen, just open your camera on the cell phone, and uh, scan it in, and it'll take you directly to uh, the comments. Uh, to the questions page and you can send us comments and questions through to us oh, they're moving quick and they're really far down that side you know, they're really on uh, Trials Dam Road AMAs are back, and this time it's with Nature's Medicine Man, Steve Falkenbridge. Isn't he magnificent? Where are you running, boy? Steve is best known for his deep love of the bush and profound respect for animals. So we're going to harvest some bark and some leaves of this tree because then I'm going to set up a little bit of a tea station. Join Steve on the 31st of August with your questions ready to ask him anything on Wild Earth. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not confused here because they, this, these buffaloes are coming from the south, east. This must be another, uh, uh, I almost say trop, <laughs> a trop, <laughs> a trop of buffaloes, um, a herd of buffaloes. And uh, I don't think this is the same herd because they're coming from the southeast and the other ones were in the west, the western side of Juma. So we are very 
Oh, and I can look at it. Look, at it. I'm coming straight from that side. Ah. Can imagine having two huge herds of buffalo here on uh, Juma. I think it's going to be a lot of action. And a huge male coming at the moment, straggler. All stragglers are uh, the last males that come through when the rest of the herd has passed by, and they're usually like big old boys. Always wait for the last males, or the last ones to come through here. Yeah. Yeah, no. We shall see. But I'm sure those other ones are in the west. <laughs> Amazing when the buffaloes come through, they come through in numbers. Why should they still come in? They're still running in. Wow, and they're gonna head straight to those Nkumas. And I know that uh, uh, Tess is heading towards the Nkumas and uh, the cubs, so I'm hoping that we can have some fantastic. Let's. Uh, all right, let's go to over Rolf. Let's go over to Rolf. He's got something awesome to show you guys. So, folks, excuse me for the cars in the background, but we these cheetah made a move towards this giraffe, and we've consequently learned and seen. I was taking some photos, and I can see why they went for the giraffe because the giraffe's busy giving birth. And these cheetah are now surrounding it, obviously in the hopes that they could get a meal as soon as this giraffe, the little one, is born. And now you can see that the, the female is, um, she's very concerned, as she would be. And they're all around her, shame. And she's trying to give birth there. You can see the legs sticking out. Shame, and she's trying to give birth now with three cheetah hanging around. That cannot be comfortable. Giving birth firstly and then knowing the stress that there's predators waiting. Shame. That poor mommy. But she's got a hell of a kick on her, so I think she's probably trying to not give birth now, I would imagine, with these predators around, but she wouldn't be able to stop it. And I'm sure she's going to use her kick if she does give birth and those cheetahs could try and come in there. We may have an injured cheetah because woe be tired. She's going to defend that with her life. What an incredible sighting. We thought that the cheetah were really being over optimistic and then I only saw because of the photos that I was taking and I saw the legs. Absolutely incredible. Shame, so sorry for the vehicles there once again in the back. Are near to the fence line. And a very stressed mommy giraffe. Sorry for the the talking as well. It is just vehicles, safari vehicles that have also been attracted by this. Now they've seen us stopped and watching, so they've responded too. The guests all coming to enjoy this stressful 
moment. You know, this could take a couple of hours. So not necessarily that we see the birth itself, but I really hope that she manages to give birth. There, the baby is moving, so that's a good sign. Those legs just straightened. So the little baby giraffe is alive. So the guide's just speaking in Isikosa, just to report this to ecology. That's what they were saying. It is quite far away, so I'm also looking with my binoculars, watching. Tina, I have to agree with you. I really want these cheetah to leave this mommy. She's trying to give birth and it's really not the kind of thing you want around when you're giving birth. It's three predators. Shame. I really feel for her. See the stress as well. She constantly sort of licking, sticking the tongue out. It's sort of a stress sign. She's probably also in a bit of pain. She can't worry about her bodily functions at the moment with those ch cheetah around. So it is really distracting her. I haven't seen a giraffe actually giving birth, so it is pretty rare, um, in my eyes anyway. You don't often get to see a uh, um, <laughs> firstly a giraffe giving birth, and secondly with cheetah running around at the same time. So it is indeed very special, very rare, and I'm just hoping that she can give birth and then defend it. There's also a lot of licking that goes on afterwards, trying to get rid of all this sort of sack and things that is surrounding the baby, so it needs a lot of attention. Our apologies for that, folks. We will just see if we can get Rolf and Morgan to reposition for us so we can hopefully get back to that mommy giraffe. But oh my goodness, what a sight! That is absolutely incredible. I have literally, I have not yet seen a giraffe birth in all of my career or life. Um, I have, however, missed one by, I think, yes, it must have been five minutes. <laughs> So uh, that really is a sight to behold and hopefully she has that baby safely and hopefully the cheetahs don't bother them. We are now back in Mashatu. As you can see, beautiful scenery over here. Just had the ostriches off to our right. And uh, that female really is still playing hard to get with the male. Shame, he's really, really having to work for it. Just want to see if they've completely moved off into the bush. Or if they are in fact still sticking around for us.
So ostriches actually have a very interesting sexual dimorphism. I'm sure Andrea has educated you on this before as well. But males have the completely black feathers, whereas females are a more grey colour. And many believe the reason for that is the male will incubate the, ma the eggs at night. And then the female will incubate the eggs during the day, which gives her better camouflage. Again, everything in nature is really thought out perfectly. It was really funny. I thought he's running in slow motion, but that is in fact just how he walked. He's really, really trying to get the female's attention over to the right. And then, as you saw earlier, they'll sort of go down and do this funky dance. And then sometimes she will join in participating. It depends on her mood, of course. She is, of course, a woman, so... Every day is different. <laughs> and sometimes they'll have to work harder for it. But hopefully, hopefully, that'll be awesome. Honestly, if we can have ostrich babies. Also something I've never seen in my actual life. I've seen it on, on many cameras. But not yet for myself. So just to experience that in itself would be awesome. Perhaps we can be this ostrich wingman. Excuse the pun. So this giraffe is going through full contractions. It seemed like the baby was coming a little bit more now. But still concerned about those cheetah. I don't know where they are and if they're still very close to this giraffe because they disappeared through the thickets there. And we've lost interest in the cheetah. You see, she does seem interested. However, she is really, really making it hard for him. As she should, um, definitely. <laughs> One of my favorite things in the bush as well on safari was checking out the southern mast weavers. Because they are in fact, before they can even discuss marriage and kids and all of that, the male has to build the female a nest. And if she likes it, then she'll consider, you know, starting to date him and all of that. If she does not, she breaks it down and he has to start all over again. I mean, this ostrich female seems to have the same concept right now. She's just like, I see you, but I don't see you. You're really going to have to work for it. So hopefully, maybe we just need to help him a little bit.
So for those of you that were with us on Escape to Nature today, I mentioned that I love talking to animals, whether it be calling them, making their noises. But right now I'm going to try a different tactic. And just bear with me, I'm going to see if I can help this poor male ostrich out by playing him a song. Bow, 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 bow. You see what I tell you? Alrighty, maybe she needs to hear more. Bow, 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 bow. Let's get it on. Oh, there's movement. We've got movement. We are achieving something. Look at that. I think if my mom is listening, she'll probably tell me, Jy het skroeflos, which means you've got a screw loose. And I told many of you that joined us earlier today as well, as a naturalist or field guide, I'm sure you have noticed, we do have a few screws loose because we've probably been in the bush too long, but we would not change it for anything. We love the bush. And of course, they go behind the bush now. So hopefully that means something. I feel a bit offended right now. I mean, I sang them the song. I got the mood right and everything, and now they're behind a bush. It's, um, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I'm, I'm not too happy right now. I want to see, whoo, there we go, coming out of the bush again. Nope, I give up. I can only play Cupid so long. Honestly, I've really given them every chance. Maybe we should just give them some privacy. So I'm just gonna take a look around the watering hole and see what else everyone else might be up to. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll give them complete privacy and uh, I will, of course, keep an eye on them for you. <laughs> but in the meanwhile, let's head on back over to Tess and see what she's up to. Go ahead. <laughs> we have got the most perfect timing. Now, these animals are really mobile northeast from 
monkey orange towards Zoe's. So I think if you drive up Zoe's, I might get your audio and then I'll be able to call you in. Look at this, I've got a whole pile of lines above my head. Hi. This is amazing. Hello, girls. I'm turning on the Zoe's from Copy that. Keep coming north. I'll let you know if I get your audio. So we have the people wanting to come in. Get the radio on. Because, of course, we don't want them to miss the moving lines. I'm not sure where they've decided to go. The buffalo are on the opposite direction. So the lines have clearly given up on that idea. <clears throat> and myself and Panda were just um, having a look at the different lines. Because this one here, this one, hello, look at its tail. Look there. <laughs> it's the same lion <laughs> that keeps getting its tail completely mauled by the other lions. It's still wet, it's still covered in saliva. You can actually see the saliva on it, look there. Ah, the other vehicle found us. <laughs> okay, so... These lions are clearly the very same ones who have been sucking on each other's tails and leaving us in absolute hysterics. And I think it is quite fitting to spend some time with them again because the last time I did, I was with Panda. So here we go again. Oh, bless you. Good sneeze. Good sneeze. Oh, look at that, a whole family of lines crossing over Zoe's road. I'm happy that my general sense of direction works, Panda. <laughs> High five. All right, so because there are two other vehicles in the sighting, we're going to take turns to follow them. I just want this cub to finish moving before we move again, because then we can get a little bit closer and find spaces for all of us to view them. It is getting dark as well, so just now I'm sure we'll flick over into infrared, but for now, it looks like we still have enough light, eh, Panda? Stunning. Right, it has joined the rest of the pride. Let us reposition just a smidgen. Let's see if we can get another view. All right, so I'll stop here so we can watch them moving off into that block just to give them a bit of space on the road and then we shall follow once they've moved off the road a bit. Oh, look at them. So the way they're going they're going to end up on Rebecca's road possibly heading up towards even quarantine. Quarantine is in that direction. I wonder what their plan is from here, where they are planning to go. But what an unusual day of sightings. We've had the lions moving now, the ostrich is doing the mating dance. That amazing sighting with Rolf with the cheetah and the giraffe. That is unreal. Go ahead. Right, let's move. Thank you, Pondo. I am going to reverse and go around because I can't go through the tree. So I shall go around it. Oh, and Dewey put on a performance. Yes. What a day of activity, everybody. Isn't this just the best? <laughs> Bonnie, I agree. There is absolutely nothing wrong with Nkuma action. It is just too good to be true, isn't it? Having a whole pride of lions moving. Ah, you're going to. Apologies, we'll try to get back to Tess and her lions as soon as I, as soon as we can. <laughs> but I just really wanted to show you this blacksmith lapwing with the youngsters again. 
at Juma. And of course, she is sitting on them again. The animals seem to be teasing me a lot today. A lot of things happening before I want to show you. And then just as soon as I show you, then they're like, no, no, nothing, nothing happening over here. Everything is all right. But hopefully she gets up now. I'm sure many of you have seen them. Four chicks that hatched either on Saturday or on Sunday. And mommy and daddy are taking super, super good care of them. Honestly, it's it's just incredible how such a small bird... Oh, just look at it. Sorry, how such a small bird, and I'm talking about the adult lap wing can you know be very 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 fierce and feisty when it comes to their little ones she's just calling it come back little one Oh my goodness, that is so cute. Honestly, just want to put one in my pocket and not tell her. <laughs> but she would definitely be on my case. But even she's, just from this past weekend up to today, they've really, really grown a lot. I don't know if any of you would agree with me, but sure, that's really, really impressive. And of course, you know, they do have to grow very fast. Mother Nature has as always very perfectly work that out because other birds of prey even water monitors other animals could feast on these little ones however i don't know how full that would make you it's like literally having half a chicken nugget but of course in the bush everything becomes food at any time especially if you don't know when you're going to get food again oh but that is just priceless And those cute, cute noises they make. That tip, 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 tip. And they already, I have to say, they're already so much more confident in comparison to Sunday. Like they really confidently wandering off and uh, just doing their own thing. Mommy is also completely trusting them already. That's really, oh wow, that's so special. Delve deeper into what Wild Earth can offer you. Register for free on our website and you can interact with our guides whilst watching your favorite show. Once registered, you will also have access to some extra special content. There might be something along here. I think we should go have a look. Registration includes filling in your email address and creating a password. It's that easy. Wild Earth, it's in your nature.
got here at well, the right time. Them, God, coming, uh, A negative, they've gone north up Zoe's Red, they're currently static about halfway up Zoe's Red now. And they went south towards Trias Dam. Wow! Look at that. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone's with them now. So they're all on, copy that, on top of a termite mound looking so regal. I mean, can we just take this in, everybody? <sighs> Perfect moment. If we had arrived at that lion sighting, a minute later we would have missed them and we might not have found them again. Do you know that? Because Panda and I went to go and find them and we were the first people to go and find them again. Oh. Look at those eyes. And as we got there, they had started moving. So we would have missed them if we had gone a minute later. So it's that perfect time of day. It's nice and cool. And they've moved enough that they've now got a beautiful height advantage on a termite mound. And they're making decisions and they might move from there. Oh, did it just put its paw on top of the other one's paw, Panda? Oh, it did, and I was just taking it off. That's so cute. How's that for a picture of two generations? That is absolutely gorgeous. I wonder what they're listening to. I remember there are other vehicles in the sighting, so we'll hear people, you'll hear cameras. Of course, who wants to miss a moment like this one? You can't blame them. A little bit of Nkuma action. We're happy to share it. Well, it looks quite different in infrared. I think I like this better at this time of day. It looks so beautiful. The black of their eyes and their noses and their mouths really stands out. Oh, big yawn. So I'm not sure where the other seven are, probably around the back somewhere, spread out, but because this is the side that the sunset is on, it's the best lit and they're the highest up looking out. And I don't really think we can ask for any better. It must be the lucky leopard print jackets, Panda. for a good grooming session, something stuck in the mouth. And a yawn, wow. <laughs> so if you'd like to know anything about these lines or anything else, if you wanna tell me what you think of the lines, I'd like to hear it. Any comments that you have for me, please send them through. You can scan the QR code that's on the screen, or you can just go to wildearth.tv forward slash questions. You have to be registered to be able to <clears throat> submit questions and comments, but please do head over there and Oh, bless you. Let me know what you think, or maybe tell the little lion cub, bless you. Whatever you'd like to contribute <laughs> would be brilliant. We love the interaction. It makes everything 50 times more enjoyable. It's the best part of being live, I think. <laughs> Sharing the magic. I wonder what they've heard. So they're looking up towards Rebecca's Road. I just can't get over this cub's gaze. It reminds me a bit of Kachava's cub in Sumi. Hmm. That gaze up on a termite mound takes me straight back to Valentine's Day with Kachava and her cub.
Wow. So I particularly enjoy that termite mound's face as well. It's very dramatic where it's washed away. I think that's what makes it. It looks like a cliff. It looks like the Lion King. <clears throat> but just imagine what these lions must be feeling at this point. It's cooled down enough that they can move. They've got a height advantage, which is absolutely brilliant. They're, at the moment, they're above a lot of the tree line because we're in the seep line on Zoe's. So there's a lot of silver cluster leaf, a lot of large fruited bush willow. So they're above the tree line. And the termite mound, because it's got grass on one side, it's quite cushiony. So they found a soft, safe, high up spot to rest and have a look out for potential dinner or threats. And if it does start getting cold, the cubs would actually be able to keep warm by staying on the termite mound too. Not that they need it because they're a cuddle puddle, I suppose, but just in case. Right, and just an update for everybody because I know it is an insanely cool sighting that Rolf had at Amakala. We are going to have to catch up with them tomorrow morning on our sunrise safari. The light has dropped so much that they physically cannot stay there anymore. They cannot see. So they're going to have to follow up in the morning. And so on the sunrise safari, I'm sure Rolf will have an update for us. But you can imagine staying out after dark in a situation like that. Not the most ideal, one we can't see, but also it's not the safest for the giraffe either. So much better for them to follow up in the morning. Just so everybody knows. Look how that lioness just put her head on the cub's head, Panda. I wonder if this is a mother-daughter duo or a mother-son duo. They are so close. It's amazing. Oh, big yawn. Wow. No, oh, it's definitely a young male. Look at that little mane starting under his ears. She looks like she's got a few little scars and things on her neck there. Those darker spots. I wonder what that might be from. Maybe fighting? So Cedric was talking about their table manners this morning and how there's not really many table manners with lions. There's a lot of snarling and snapping and scratching and, and biting. You might find it could be from that. Could even be from previous mating incidents because I'm sure you've seen videos of lions mating before. Maybe you've even seen it on the show. And uh, it's the same with leopards. It's a little bit different and the male grips the female behind the neck. Could even be from that in previous years. A build up because she is quite an experienced lioness I believe. Oh, that is amazing. Oh, are you going to give us a yawn girl? Look at those white eyeliners <clears throat> underneath the eye there, that little white section of hair that looks like eyeliner. Very useful when hunting at night. Helen, they can definitely smell our scents in the vehicle. So they're used to the, the shape of the vehicle. It's not necessarily the smell of the vehicle that they associate, it's the shape. So when we're in the vehicle and everybody's sitting down, of course, that definitely keeps the shape whole. They're used to that. They're habituated to that. But they can definitely smell each individual person. They can probably smell more about us than we can about ourselves. Um, they can probably smell our hormones and things like that. Anything that might be happening in our bodies, they can definitely pick up. Animals are very intuitive to these things. <clears throat> 
but um, because we're on the vehicle, they're associating us as part of the vehicle. They can smell the different parts, but as one bigger thing, if that makes sense. Very different if I was walking. It's the same smell, probably with just a bit less petrol and, and smoke um, from Wendy, but they can still smell me. The difference is if I was off Wendy, if I was walking, it's the shape of me walking that poses the potential threat because humans on foot are technically a threat. Oh, where humans in a car are part of the car and that car is habituated as a really big, weird sounding, smelly, smoky metal animal, I suppose, that they get used to. But wildlife can definitely smell many more things than we can and they're they're quite used to us moving around and talking. They get used to our voices as well. And so it's not really, um, not really anything new for them, I suppose. But I don't know if you've ever seen those videos, you know, just to show how intuitive animals are. There are plenty of videos of wildlife being able to tell when somebody's pregnant, for example. Um, you know, those hormonal changes might not be as obvious to us. I mean, I, you know, as humans, we can't really smell when someone else is pregnant or whatever cycle they're in, whether they've got a bit of heightened testosterone, we can probably tell from their behavior, but we definitely can't smell it, you know. But animals are definitely capable of doing that. And um, there's been many instances of wildlife reacting differently to different people because of something like hormonal changes. Very interesting. Oh, where are you going, Cubby? Down the back. Alrighty. We're definitely having all of the cat action today. I think the only thing Panda now we're missing was a leopard this afternoon, but we got so lucky this morning with tortoise pan, we can't complain. We definitely can't complain. But um, <clears throat> speaking of leopards, this is a great opportunity for me to remind you about our leopard fest coming up. I'm so excited. It's going to be from the 1st to the 4th of September. And it's basically just a celebration of our royal family of leopards in Juma reigning back to Queen Karula back in those days. So throughout the sunset safaris, what we'll be doing is basically just taking a trip down memory lane. So we'll be playing out some sightings from our archives. And if you are a long-term Wild Earth viewer and you want to let us know what clip you'd like to see played out, we would absolutely love to hear that from you. So you can send that information to us. If you can, add a date or even a link. That would be even better. Um, and then you can also tell us your name so we can let everyone know who sent in the suggestion. And you can send that to leopards at wildearth.tv to celebrate our royal family here at Juma. Now you will see there is a spotlight. So remember, we use infrared, but the normal game viewers use normal spotlights. So that's the light that you can see at the moment. You can also hear a vehicle moving. You can hear some branches in the background. Don't be alarmed. We do know that they are here, <laughs> as do the lines, as I'm sure you can see. Oh, big yawn. Wow, those teeth. Right, so I think the rest of the pride is slowly starting to move, possibly. It looks that way. From the way the lionesses are looking, it seems like the other lions might be wanting to start moving further northeast towards Rebecca's. Cecile, I agree with you. It is very very impressive that these lionesses have managed to raise all seven cubs <clears throat> to this age. Do you remember when that one male cub was limping so badly he was thin he couldn't keep up? I remember that clearly and thinking you know he even got separated from the cubs and you you don't really ever know what's going to happen and um, it's really impressive that they've managed to keep everybody together and strong and healthy and fit but don't forget <clears throat> lions are still vulnerable up to the age of two years and even beyond that. So they've done an exceptional job and hopefully they continue to do so. I don't have any doubts that they will continue to do so. But it is the wild, so we can't guarantee. All right, we are going to have a look. <laughs> that was incredible. Yes, the lions are certainly moving. <clears throat> Sorry, everyone, I've got a bit of a 
a frog in my throat, as my mum would call it. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to see if I can catch up with these lions. They look like they're moving steadily towards Rebecca's road. So whether or not we'll catch up, I don't know. It's a very thick block, but we will try our best. Yeah, it's just sitting on Biffles of Cutline, enjoying those beautiful colorations with the Drakensberg in the background, setting as a backdrop. But I'm just going to have a bit of a, a silent moment here and enjoy Good evening, ladies and Thank you. <laughs> enjoy the, the colors and the sounds. Henry, yes, definitely. It looks like the sky is on fire. <laughs> that, that orange is absolutely amazing. -zing. It is really stunning. I think that's that, that orange color that's come through, but oh, yeah, that's why it's breathtaking. I'm just reflecting on an entire day today. Wow, with everything. This is where you grab your drink of uh, beverage of preference and enjoy the sunset. Everybody, we have had to leave the lion sighting. They have moved into such a thick section towards the drainage line that I was not willing to follow with Wendy. In fact, the other vehicles left as well, so it wasn't just us. It's just a little bit too thick, and by us trying to get through there, especially at night, not only can we damage the vehicles, but we can also damage the environment, which is actually the bigger concern. And we don't want to stress the lions by causing so much noise trying to get through drainage lines and through those thick very very thick sections especially at night with all the water holes and things so all of us have vacated the area the lions are moving steadily so I think they're just gonna keep moving late into the night until they find somewhere that they're wanting to go or something they're wanting to do but what a brilliant sighting <laughs> I'm very happy so from here, myself and Panda are going to head towards the western side of Juma. So we're going to do a little bit of Impala Plains, Impala Road, where we had tortoise pan this morning. We're going to head up towards the north, towards Sandy Patch, and see what's on that side. We might get lucky. This is actually a really good area for porcupines as well. We've seen a lot of porcupine scats along, along Rebecca's <clears throat> and Balanites Road. multiple sets of tracks as well not just one set so maybe we might see my first no second porcupine on juma i've seen the first one hey panda it might have been with you hmm. but it was a very quick view and it disappeared <laughs> wow that was brilliant <laughs> 
That's funny, Cedric is also heading in this direction. Alrighty then, I might have to change my plan. That is funny. It's a good thing I've only just come through a junction, I shall turn. <laughs> Penny, that's a really cool question. Yes, I do think they're ticklish under their paws. They're sensitive under their paws. That's a good way to put it. And this would make sense. So lions have incredibly soft toe pads and palm pads. So that, that beautiful silky looking texture of the skin underneath their, their paws, that's really the key to their success. That combined with the claws, very opposite things, soft and spiky, if you look at it that way. That's ultimately one of the keys to their success, you know, being able to walk very quietly and things. But what it also means is as tough as they are, when they stand on a thorn or something, they feel it and they have to take it out. But they might then also be ticklish. I don't think it will be... Go ahead. I don't think it'll be for something like flies. Copy that, thanks. Um, but it would apply to, for example, if you did it like you do with a domestic cat and you put your fingers in between a cat's toe pads and you start playing with the little hairs, they're going to feel it and they're going to pull their paw back because it's sensitive. And I think we perceive that as ticklish. And for them, it's just sensitive. It just feels funny. Something's touching the paw. And it might not necessarily be the same feeling that we feel when we feel ticklish. But for them, they probably pull the paw back because they know it's a sensitive area and they don't want anything touching it because you've got to protect the paw. But I suppose, yeah, we perceive that as ticklish. So you probably find they are. I think especially if you're dealing with the little hairs in between. But definitely, was that a sneeze, Panda? Yeah. <laughs> Bless you. That was a very weird sneeze. <laughs> I loved it. It was really good. Very elegant held back sneeze um, yeah I think they are still quite sensitive though so if they step on a thorn or something for sure they will also know about it <laughs> Sammy in my ears also saying bless your all right let's see what we can find so now that I'm not going to the west I'm doing the top end of Zoe's which will take me back to Voyotella access and then from here I'll go back towards quarantine and then down Philemon's dip, that area, Ingwe Alley, have a look around there. Either way we've got a, a decent chance of, when I say a decent chance of anything I mean both areas are equally good for pretty much anything. Whether or not we'll find it though being at night time, I don't know, I suppose we'll see. But it may actually be a decent time, Sammy, considering we've had such a fantastic day with so many brilliant sightings. It might be a fantastic time to do a sneaky fast five now that I'm back. Let me know what you think. Let me know, let me know. <laughs> if you want to ask me some crazy questions, please do. Been exceptionally lucky on this road thinking about it and in that far northern section where the silver clusterly forest is quite thick i've been very lucky there that one evening i saw a civet a genet and an african wildcat in the space of about 50 meters of that silver clusterly thicket that was not actually too long ago Let's see what we might find. I'm approaching that very thick section of silver cluster leaf now, so fingers crossed it might be something amazing. Join me, David, along with our expeditioners as we take a look at the highlights of this week in the Masai Mara. What have you enjoyed most? about your trip. The leopard that we saw in the Mara was just phenomenal. She was so beautiful. It's going to be hard to leave. This highlight 
Fires and Chat is open to all registered viewers. Register for free on our website. What a wonderful afternoon, that's all I can say. What a wonderful afternoon. Uh, and Kuruma's there with uh, Tess, uh, herd of buffalo. And then on top of that, brilliant uh, giraffe giving birth with the uh, cheetahs watching. At Amakala with Ralph. Absolutely amazing. -zing. That is just uh, what a great day. I love a day like that. It's always different uh, things happening all over the show. But yes, no leopardo. I did look uh, for Tlomas tracks. I, I didn't find any fresh tracks this afternoon. No fresh tracks. I did the entire Molawati from from uh, Spaghetti Crossing right through to Gary Dam. I uh, went on foot there. I walked all over the show in that area. And I found absolutely nothing on uh, even a track that side. So I don't know where the, really the last track was. It was difficult to tell. Let's take a look up here. This beautiful colours here. Well, of course, as you know, this Saturday coming. So on Saturday, on the far side is our far side chat in Mara for the fourth from the in the Maasai Mara, and it promises to be definitely a wonderful one. We have a great group of guests once again for you to meet. And of course, uh, and join us at 7.30 p.m. Central African time and 8.30 Eastern African time on the week. And that we, on that week, can look at, look at on the week that we've just had there in the Mara, which has been fantastic once again. If you need to scan the QR code just to find out more about that fireside chat in the Mara. So that is this, this Saturday. So yes, definitely looking forward to, forward to that. 7.30 p.m. Central African time and 8.30 Eastern African time. This Saturday, fire subject. Beautiful colors that, uh, that orange. Absolutely amazing. I'm just, I'm just, it seems like there's a fire on the other side, but it's not. It's just the sun that uh, set behind as Drakensberg and it's just kind of giving that beautiful glow that's coming through with this lovely marula, what was that, a marula tree, almost said a marula, marula tree. And I think I should just try to listen out for anything, maybe I'll 
some sawing, maybe uh, Tabangumi this side or even Kara. And that's why I'm on Abel's road at the moment. All right, I am going to quickly go down here and just see if we can get our last uh, second uh, Janet. Because I've been so fortunate with our Janet, uh, Janet over on this open clearing here. So I am going to try and see. We're not too far. We're like two, three minutes out from that side. So I want to see if we can get that uh, Jeanette there. I love that little Janet. It's been it's such a such a relaxed uh, Janet as well. So yeah, let's see if we can get there. Ooh, ah, yo, okay, almost took my arm off there. But yes, what a wonderful evening again, or what a wonderful afternoon here around on uh, our sunset safari. Definitely a beautiful sunset safari. Uh, Claudia, it's difficult to say because every person is different. Um, I, I learned it through the years when I was working at Arethusa. So when I was at Arethusa, and we used to come on me, of course, and then I knew I got to learn all these routes and all the roads around here. Um, but every guide is different. Some guides, you know, they rely on their trackers because the trackers will know, uh, you know, the area and will point them. And then they tend to kind of, how can I say, delay on learning these roads. Uh, but myself, uh, I like to know if I'm going to, if I'm following it like a pride of lines and they go in here, and there's other guys responding to uh, the sighting. I'd like to tell those guys where they must come in or where they must wait on which road is on that side where the lines are heading to. So it just makes, it gives me more confidence on, on controlling a sighting and I feel that is uh, very important. Um, so it can take you three, four days, it can take you three, four weeks, three, four months. Every, every guide's got their own way of uh, learning. I started learning right in the beginning in 2006, 2007 with a certain manner of doing, uh, drawing it. So draw the map, uh, the borders, and then you slowly work your way in. And then take the vehicle, go out with the vehicle, and drive all over and uh, you know, see which roads and get little waypoints. It's not the easiest waypoints, but you know, trees or a drainage line or water hole, things like that. Anyway, I'm almost yeah, at. I think I want to see if I can get the Janet. Okay, are we, we on Vuyo Till Access? Let's see. One minute, one minute. We should be there. I love that little Janet. He's been always hanging around this open clearing. Deb, da, Deb Dash, Deb Dash, huh? I also didn't get it. Well, no, I'm not too sure of the name, sorry. But between the drives, well, I try to sometimes grab a book and read a bit, find out more stuff, look after Rusty and Wendy, make sure that they are all kept in top-notch uh, top condition. I'll try to. Oh, they're doing it right. So we've got a lot of other little things between times of drives, you know. Some people like to do a little bit of uh, gymming, and workouts and fitness and running. I need to get into that again. I know I need to get the, my fitness in again. So yes, I'm sure sooner or later, once it starts warming up a bit. All right, let's do last quickly. Yes, this is open clearing. Fine, oh, there's just a lot of impalas here. Hopefully, maybe the maybe the Janet is hunting these impalas. <laughs> you can imagine that Janet hunting the impalas. Yeah, there's plenty of impalas here. Oh no! Sorry, a lot of impalas. I don't want to shine in their eyes, of course. Uh, no, Janet. I think he's. Uh, I've decided to maybe utilise a different area this evening. Nah. Oh, I'm just going to put the lights off here and enjoy a 
little bit of impalas yeah let's take a look at them yeah let me put on the impalas don't want to put the light on there but yeah what a beautiful beautiful evening great sunset drive and i think uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed it this uh this afternoon and thank you very much for all your comments all your questions for everything this afternoon we really do appreciate it we do appreciate you guys watching as well and hopefully you guys had just as much fun as we did on this uh, stunning sunset drive but yes tomorrow morning is another day the sunrise safari and I'm hoping those uh, Nkugumas lines they do come right with the buffalo will be fantastic and we can get to see them but yes as you can see the last couple of nice impalas hanging around here on the open clearing I'm sure they're also saying uh, good night and uh, they're uh, enjoying their last bit of feed before they go and have a rest for the evening but yes, from the Wild Earth uh, crew, from all of us, once again, thank you and have a wonderful evening. And carcasses, viewer discretion is advised.